Hello everyone. Okay, assalamualaikum and a very good day to you. Uh, you are still with me for JKE 316E Quantitative Economics. So this is part 7 and we are covering chapter 20. Okay, and the topic is time series analysis. So the background of the slide basically give you a hint already what you will be doing in terms of we are looking, going to look at graphs and we are going to make some forecasts okay, based on your analysis of time series. Okay, as usual, okay, the main reference for our uh, uh, syllabus will be uh, the text by Keller, okay, 2012, Managerial Statistic, the 9th edition, produced by Southwestern Sengage Learning. And the slide that I'm using currently is based on Keller, uh, 8th edition, okay, in 2009, as, uh, and the copyright of uh, all the material, okay, unless I mention otherwise, will be belongs to uh, Sengage Learnings. Okay, now we are going to look at chapter 20, time series analysis in summary. Okay, the first part will be you looking at the time series components. There are four different components of time series. We'll be looking at each one in detail. So we have the component in terms of trend, and then we have the component in terms of cyclical, and then we have the seasonal component, as well as the random component of a time series. Okay, if you look at the trend, okay, later we, you will come out with a long-term trend of a time series, okay, you will come out with a regression equations. So instead of having uh, y equals to alpha plus beta x, okay, that one is the equation for the uh, simple regression model. But what you have now is your regression model will be y equals to a plus uh, b t. Okay, so A is still your alpha or your intercept uh, point. B is still the slope of the line, but T now stood for time instead of your X variable. So later I'm going to share with you all the different kind of graph to show time series. But basically, okay, what you have is your X variable in terms of the uh, time. Time can be in terms of days, minutes, hours, okay, year, quarter, week, and all that. So your time variable will be on the horizontal axis or the x axis while your y axis will be uh, anything that you're talking about. It can be GDP, it can be in terms of income, it can be in terms of uh, price, it can be in terms of uh, sales revenue. That will be your vertical axis. Okay, we'll look into that in details later. Okay, cyclical, seasonal, okay, and then you will come up with seasonal indexes, what's the use of seasonal indexes, and then we also cover a little bit of random variable, and we'll be discussing the two methods, okay, of time series in terms of moving averages as well as exponential smoothing, okay, and later, okay, basically we'll talk about the uses of time series in terms of doing forecasting, and there are three different types of forecasting techniques, Okay, it can be in terms of exponential smoothing or it can be in terms of seasonal indexes and uh, it can be in terms of autoregressive model which is quite outside the syllabus okay, for now. Okay, before we go further, let's look at the basic concept in time series analysis. What is a time series? A time series is just okay, from the word time. So it, it refers to a collection of observation of well-defined data item Okay, observe through time. So time it has to be measured at equally space interval. So we are talking about every week, okay, or every month, or every quarter, or every year, every hour, every day, okay, every minute, okay, every half an hour, and so on and so forth. So the example of uh, time series can be the monthly industrial production index. Okay, if you are a manufacturer, for example. So or uh, if you are a uh, Consumer, basically, you'll be more familiar with the CPI, Consumer Price Index. So, that's one example of a time series. So, data that is being collected irregularly or only once, so that is not time series. So, let's look at the first example of time series. So, the graph that you have on screen is what we call as the performance of the manufacturing sector. Okay, in terms of the growth rate for Malaysia, Okay, uh, for 2009 and 2010. So this is a monthly time series. So you have, uh, okay, if you look at the uh, horizontal axis, okay, or the x axis, 
So you have uh, January, February, March, April and so on Okay, for 2009 And then you have the same cycle again January, February, March and so on For 2010 And this graph is uh, a combination of three different time series So the one in red is actually the growth rate of export Of uh, manufacturing export in Malaysia for 2009-2010 Okay, that's the red line and then you see the green line which refer to the sales revenue, the growth rate of sales revenue for the manufacturing sector. While the actual output, okay, or the production of the manufacturing sector is shown by the blue line. Okay, so the time series is different from the uh, regression or the where you have your scattered diagram where it's just a dot dot, okay, and then you connect, okay, and then the... Uh, you, uh, you need to produce the line of best fit Okay, you don't connect the dots basically But for time series, okay, you need to collect uh, You need to connect your dots Okay, in terms of uh, your observation through times Okay, so this data is available from the Department of Statistics Malaysia Or you can always refer to the actual report Okay, from the Treasury of the nation's governments Okay, let's look at another example of a time series just now, you already look at the performance of the manufacturing sector as a whole. So, for currently, what you see on screen is the manufacturing sector, okay, the performance of manufacturing sector. But this time, we're looking at the selected industries. So, we are still looking at the uh, growth rate or the annual percentage change, okay. So, you have on the left side of the screen, okay, the bar, okay, is referring to the products, okay, uh, construction products. Okay, so and the red line is referring to wood and wood products. Okay, the green line is referring to these uh, transportation equipments. Okay, and then you have the blue line which refers to chem uh, chemical as well as chemical products. And the lighter green or the apple green is referring to the rubber product. So you see that uh, this is the uh, selected industries. Okay, so because um, Malaysia is uh, well known for the export of rubber as well as the export of wood products okay and then we have the uh, those chemical products so we want to see okay the growth rates okay so we have a negative growth rate okay for 2009 okay and then we have a positive okay mostly in 2010 okay so it shows okay uh, the time series for all these different uh, industries sub industries in manufacturing sector Okay, and then if you look at the right hand side of the screen, so you have the output of the manuf manufacturing sector in terms of their uh, growth rate or the annual percentage change. Okay, this time we have four different index. Okay, index is another topic that I'm going to explore with you, okay, uh, in the next couple of uh, sessions. Okay, so the one in bar is referring to the uh, manufacturing output index. Okay, that's the bar. And then you have the red lines which refer to the index for the manufacturing uh, output, okay? And then uh, you have the green line which refer to these uh, domestic-oriented industries, okay? And then you have uh, the blue line which refer to these export-oriented industries. So if you are into research or if you are policy maker interested uh, into the performance of the manufacturing sector whether as a whole or in terms of selected industries or in terms of the indexes okay so time a series is very useful in this third example of time series i'm going to share with you okay some example of time series in terms of money and banking syllabus okay earlier i already shared with you in terms of industrial economics where we talk about manufacturing this manufacturing that in terms of export oriented okay domestic uh, oriented industries now let's look at for example okay on the left hand side on top we have the monetary aggregates okay so in this case we have the blue line okay in terms of monetary aggregates the first one okay we have the narrow money that is the m1 we're still talking about the growth rates okay or the annual percentage change okay so we have the annual percentage change or the growth rate of m1 over the years from 2008 to 2009 Okay, uh, quarterly value and 2010. Okay, and we have the red line which refer to the broad money. Okay, which is M3. Okay, and the growth rate of M3 is much uh, slower 
compared to the M1 at certain stage of 2008 okay but the uh, M3 growth rate over 2 the M1 growth rate okay somewhere to it, towards the end of 2008 and early 2009 and then later in 2010 okay the growth rate of M1 overtake the growth rate of M3 again so as a policy maker by looking at this time series okay you can make a decision you can make some forecast you can make some interpretation okay in order for you to do your uh, to you for you to you uh, recommend your policy monetary policy and so on and so forth okay and the one okay on the right hand side on top so you have this uh financing for the private sector through a loan okay uh, from the banking system as well as through the capital market so we have the darker brown okay which refer to EQT financings and then we have the middle uh, shade which refer to the gross uh, PDS and then you have the very light uh, cream which refer to this uh, loan that is being uh, offered okay so you have uh, this one is not time series this one is a bar okay but if you refer to the one below and then you have the same uh, uh, indicator for the banking sector in terms of loans okay so we have the red line refer to the uh, loan applications okay the red line is the loan application and then the green line is the approved loans of course the green line is always most of the time is lower than the application and then we have the uh, blue line which refer to the actual uh, loan disperse okay disperse okay on the back to the left hand side of the screen okay the bottom part so you have uh, the banking sector in terms of cumulative loans okay so you have the bar which refer to this amount of loan accumulated and then you have the green line which refer to the annual changes okay uh, in terms of from 2006 2007 2008 2009 and 2010 so basically uh, those lines is uh, as uh, are example of time series in the current example i'm sharing with you okay for student of economics so usually you have a longer time series we are talking about macro data if you're talking about inflation unemployment okay we always make reference to uh, for example the financial crisis the uh, asean financial crisis 1997 that is quite far back instead of talking about the recent global crisis the subprime crisis 2008 and then we have those uh, oil shock in the mid uh, 1970s and then we have the great depression in 1930s okay if we are talking about the Keynesian economy and all that so if we're talking about GDP okay in this case uh, we're talking about uh, log GDP gross national products okay the growth rate over the years okay what you have on screen is from as early as 1955 just now I mentioned the great depression in 1930 so the data is not here and then you see up to 2005 so this one is not an updated uh, version so you can find the same graph okay we're talking about log GDP in this case for United States you can do the same and find uh, log GDP okay the growth rate of GDP for Malaysia okay from independence 1957 for example up to the uh, the most recent one last year and maybe forecast for 2013 okay so this is for macroeconomic students basically when we talk about GDP we need to know about the growth rate so it tells you whether the economy is expanding or the economy is growing or the economy is going down in terms of having a se severe depressions okay uh, increase in price or in terms of a high degree of unemployment rate just now you already seen all the different example of uh, time series in terms of industrial economics, okay, uh, discussion, macroeconomic discussion on GDP, inflation, employment, okay, the money and banking part where we look at the uh, amount of loan, okay, from uh, commercial banks in terms of uh, the M1 and M2 narrow money and broad money, okay. Now let's look at uh, the FBM KLCI daily charts time series, okay. So this one stood for the financial times uh, stock exchange uh, bu for Bursa Malaysia Kuala Lumpur Composite Index so this is a daily time series okay it shows the daily time series so this one is for towards the end of 2011 when I capture uh, have the screen capture okay 
So you see, you see that this is the the amount of stocks that is being traded in our Kuala Lumpur Compos uh, stock exchange. Okay, the Bursa Malaysia Kuala Lumpur. Okay, so if you are into this uh, buying and selling shares, or if you are working as remiser broker, so this one will be more of interest to you. Okay, so you will understand more. We are still talking about the Bursa Malaysia. So instead of talking about the daily charts, okay, we show the daily index. Now we are going to look at the up and down that happens in one day. So in a normal working day, for example, when the market start open, uh, I do not know, maybe uh, just uh, what you see on screen is just 10 a.m. Okay, at noon, okay, and then we have the 4 p.m. Okay, so basically you see the up and down in terms of the index, okay. Here we are still talking about the Financial Times Stock Exchange Bursa Malaysia Kuala Lumpur Composite Index. So we have the, high in, the highest index value of 1518.42 and the lowest for that particular day 1514.25. Okay, it doesn't make much sense for you. Okay, but you show that basically what I'm trying to share with you is that we can be talking about so many things on the uh, y axis but what is more important okay when it comes to the x axis okay your independent so-called independent variable during the regression now instead of x what you have is time so time can be in terms of days can be in terms of hours it can be in terms of weeks can be in terms of months it can be in terms of years and it can be in terms of minutes and seconds okay now let's look into details okay what is this time series analysis is all about Okay, a variable measured over time in sequential order. Okay, so if we are talking about years, okay, 2009 must come before 2010 and before 2011. You cannot simply, okay, plug in, okay, every, uh, anywhere. For example, uh, Saturday come before Wednesday, okay, or Friday, you put in between Monday and Tuesday. So that is not in sequential order. So your time series, okay, your data must be measured over time and it has to be in sequence. It has to be in order, okay, usually it's um, uh, upsending order. So from this data, you can analyze it to detect patterns that will enable you, okay, to forecast future value of the variables. Okay, if you are the policy maker, if you are manager, if you are manager of company, for example, okay, instead of talking about the M1, M2, maybe you are more interested, for example, to know, okay, where the sales, okay, for the uh, next year, okay, where it's going to be higher than sales for this year, or is it going to be less, or, or is it going to be the same compared, okay, between the years, okay, because why you need to know that so that you can make uh, some uh, uh, policy in terms of your production line, whether you should take more workers for example so that you can produce more in order to meet the forecast increase in demand for next year or if we are talking about demand for your product is going to be lower then you need to make some changes perhaps you need to uh, buy less of your input so that you won't uh, waste your money unnecessarily so that's the use of time series later you'll be using it to forecast as you might expect this time series technique has a wide application. What uh, from what I already share with you in terms of uh, industrial economics or, or in terms of all those uh, uh, consumer price index, industrial production index, okay, and then in terms of the money and banking, we are talking about the amount, the growth rate of M1, the growth rate of M3. So uh, the Central Bank of Malaysia, that is Bank Negara, will be most interested in those uh, M1, M2, in terms of the amount of loans, okay, disbursed by the commercial banks, okay, and then in terms of the uh, GDP of Malaysia, we are interested to know whether inflation in Malaysia is uh, increasing, whether unemployment in Malaysia is decreasing, so that is basically the uh, imply uh, application of time series analysis. So in this case, as governments, okay, so remember when we talk about um, uh, the uh, in, uh, the player in macroeconomics, so you have the governments, okay, which would want to know the future value of interest rate, unemployment rate perhaps, and the percentage increase in the cost of living. So for example, right now, okay, we are in the running up towards the, the next coming uh, general election. So we have all this uh, current uh, government, okay, uh, sharing with us, okay, the economy is doing well, okay, I'm saying in a good way. Okay, so in terms of, you know, we have lower 
uh, unemployment rate okay we have uh, contained the increase in price and then they're talking about how does the standard of living in Malaysia has improved for the better and then in terms of the cost of living in Malaysia okay it's reducing for example so those are the things that governments would like to know in terms of uh, the government policy maker when it comes to the industry okay the the firms in the industry okay in this case we have the housing industry economies for example okay for example in Penang okay you need to know you you, you must be able to forecast the mortgage interest rate the demand for housing okay whether in terms of terrace house whether in terms of apartments whether in terms of bungalows okay what about the cost of building material is it going to be the same this year and last year and next year whether there's going to be an increase in price of cement in price of concrete okay and then if you look at companies you need to predict the demand for their product and the share of the markets otherwise okay they wouldn't know how much for example they need to spend on advertis uh, advertisement okay and it comes to universities like United, uh, university science malaysia or colleges okay we also do some forecasting in terms of what are the actual number of students okay that will be applying okay in terms of our actual intakes okay so uh, those are the things that we need to refer to time series analysis and so on and so far next okay when it comes to modeling a time series data okay so remember you have the different components so if you see the the, the current graph on screen what you have is the uh, if you look at the first uh, blue line okay that stands for the trend plus seasonal component okay and if you add uh, to the trend and seasonal component if you add the cycle components okay then you have the black line the one the jagged line while the cyclical effect the one that is below okay it's just one component okay not combination of three so you see a flatter uh, time series line so basically your time series whatever that you're talking about so that is your dependent variable your y okay remember y can be whatever that you're talking about can be price can be unemployment can be demand can be gdp can be money okay can be output so y is made up as uh, the time uh, the trend component multiplied with the seasonal component and plus minus the error components so if you look at the composite model before you actually came up with the time series graph okay what you need to do is plot your data okay you simply plot your observation into your graph so you see that uh, there is a pattern over there okay without linking your observation point you see that there is a up and down okay over the time period so in this case i ignore okay the exact time period but it's understood your x axis is in terms of time and the y axis is in terms of whatever that you're talking about so you plot your observation point and okay this observation point is made up in this case we're talking about sales so sales is made up of trend value multiplied with seasonal value multiplied with the cyclical value and as well as the error value so this is the uh, uh, this one we're going to look at in detail what they are being made of but what you see is just the actual data okay and you see the up and down over time okay now let's look at the time series component okay in details one by one okay so a time series can be in uh, can be consist of four different components okay we have this long-term trend and then we have the cyclical variation and then we have the seasonal variation and then the final uh, component is what we call as the random variations so what is the trend component if you look at uh, the graphs okay so remember time is always on your horizontal axis while your variable of interest y is on the vertical axis so a trend is a long term okay relatively smooth pattern or direction that persists usually for more than one year so usually uh, okay you will be saying that there is a upward trend for example when we talk about uh demand for your product okay it can be that your demand is uh, upward trend that means it's increasing or when we talk about uh, um uh demand for bungalows in penang i do not know okay it can be uh, you can say that it's downward trend that means the trend is going down over time but the time is more than one year usually much longer 
So instead of talking about the up and down, okay, within the year or within the season, okay, we are talking about over a longer period of time. For example, when we look at the GDP of Malaysia post independence, that means uh, from 1957 onwards, okay, uh, does the GDP of Malaysia, the per capita income of Malaysia, increase or decrease? What is the trend? So basically, uh, we can safely say that the trend is increase in the uh, GDP per capita, that means income per head, for example. Okay, so back to the trend component, as you can see on screen. So we have the composite observation data earlier, which you already plot into the graph of time series. Okay, so when you have the regression line, okay, a straight line which basically to show with you over the years whether the trend is increasing or decreasing, okay, so that line which best describe all your observation point that is what we call as trend okay so if we look at the observation in details you see that there are some years is you know increasing and then reduce a little bit and then increase a little bit and then reduce and then increase and then reduce but over the years throughout the period that you study the data okay there is an upward trend or downward trend it's either that okay the trend is increasing or the trend is decreasing over the years okay so a linear line a linear model we usually capture the general upward or downward trend okay in this case we are talking about steady growth so when we discuss the first component of time series that is the trend component so trend component is basically the long-term movement in a time series okay this trend okay is a reflection of the underlying level of the time series so this is typically due to influences such as the population growth, the price inflation, and general economic development. So the trend component is sometimes referred to as the trend cycles. Okay, the second component of time series is what we call as the cyclical variation. Okay, from the word cycle itself, so that is a clue, that is a hint for you. Okay, so a cycle, okay, is a wave-like pattern that describes a long-term behavior for more than one year but it's it's like uh you have like four or five years okay behave like this four or five years okay behave differently okay so cyclical pattern that are consistent and predictable so in this case uh it's quite rare for you to observe the cyclical so most of the time when you are doing forecasting usually we ignore the cyclical variation we just take into account the trend uh, component of the trend variation as well as the seasonal variation and we ignore the cyclical variation so back to the graph that i already showed with you earlier so in this case when we look at the cyclical component or the cyclical variation the, cy the cyclical variation captures the effect of long-term macroeconomic boom and bust cycle so remember you have those uh, depression and then the economy expand and then the economy is at the peak and then after that the economy is going down again so basically you have that trend uh, happening over a longer period of time but it's a cycle that is being repeated so it is quite difficult to get enough data to measure the cyclical component ac accurately okay if we look at this uh, business cycle this is one uh, concept in uh, macroeconomics to explain that you know, there are fluctu uh, fluctuations in economy, okay, especially when we discuss the monetary policy, this fiscal policy with regards to government's intervention, okay, so in this case, over time, the economy will be going through these four different phases, okay, the economy will be at the peak, so that means this is the boom period, okay, the economy is booming, okay, the, this is where the output is uh, produced very high, okay, everyone is being employed, but at the same time price also increasing so because of that okay because of the increasing price okay basically we have uh, okay increase in input prices so firms will start to uh, reduce their production okay so that will reduce the output so what we have is contractions okay so the economy will go down okay to the true okay and after that if the economy come to the part where it's being uh, 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 called as depression okay depression means people are being unemployed price is low yes 
Okay, inflation is low but people are being unemployed. Then governments need to do something. Okay, government needs to intervene, expand the economy using expansionary monetary policy or expansionary fiscal policy. Government need to spend. So the economy now is up and uh, uh, moving again towards recovery and is prosper. Okay, so this is a business cycle that is fluctuating quite a, a more than one year. Okay, but not that long as compared to time. So this is a cycle that going to be repeated. There's one theory, okay, which explain in uh, uh, in economics, which explain about the election election cycle. So usually, okay, uh, before the election, this is the the time where the economy will be at its best. Why? Because the politician need to convince, okay, people that you know they have done their job, they need to be re-elected. So the time before election is usually the economy is at its best. And after election, okay, the economy will be slowing down, okay, and okay, uh, and then towards the election only the economy is going up again. So that's one aspect or one concept that you might uh, pursue further if you are going for further studies. So let's look at this uh, business cycle in terms of the data for United States. So we are still talking about the log GDP, okay, deviation from trend in log GDP. So the trend is the red line, okay, basically what we want is uh, not much changes, okay, but if you look at the data, you have a cycle, okay, but it's very difficult to see here, but you have the economy at the peak, okay, and slowing down, and then you have the rock bottom, and then you expand again, you reach the peak, and then you going down, but that happened over a longer period of time. It doesn't happen within a year, doesn't happen within two years, it doesn't happen within uh, you know, three quarter or one month or one week. It happened more than a year, maybe a couple of years of move expanding, and then a couple of years the economy is, you know, contracting, okay, and so on and so forth. Okay, now we are going to look at the third component of a time series. The third component is what we call as the seasonal component or the, the seasonal variation. So this is no component of time series exhibit a short term. Okay, so we have the movement up and down of your variable, but it happens within a year. Okay, so it happens within a year. So if you look at the graph, you still that you know there are the peak and then going down and then bottom and then it's expanding and the peak. So it looks like a cycle, but the thing is it ha must happen within a year. Okay, so it's a calendar repetitive behavior. So this one is easier to explain, especially we are talking about the four season countries. So let's say we are talking about um, sales of uh, winter clothing. Okay, so the sales of winter clothing, if you are manufacturer of winter clothing, you will be interested to know that, you know, summer, okay, is the, 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 uh, the, the worst time in terms of your sales. Okay, autumn or fall, this is where the demand for winter clothing start to increase. And right, okay, during winter or at the start of winter, this is where, okay, the demand for winter clothing is at the highest. And after that, after winter, where you have spring, basically people chuck away their winter clothing, so demand start reducing again. Okay, so that is in terms of winter clothing. We do not have the four season in Malaysia. Okay, uh, maybe another uh, in terms of seasonal variation that we can think of in Malaysia is in terms of the festive season. Okay, demand for uh, food product, for example, uh, like chicken and beef and eggs and uh, margarine. Okay, so demand for these household uh, food items will be increasing before the Chinese New Year, before the Deepavali, before the Muslim uh, Eid. Okay, why is that? Because we eat a lot, I guess, okay, Malaysian love to eat, okay, and we have a lot of variety of food and cookies and all that. So basically, demand for those items will increase before the, uh, right immediate before the celebration period, okay, price will increase, and after the celebration period, you see that price is going down, demand is also reducing. And if you're talking about uh, school term, okay, preparation for school, the same thing, if you, Okay, school kids, they wear uniforms, so end of the year, before the start of the new term, okay, demand for uniform increase, okay, and then once the school term start, okay, basically people already settled down, okay, they don't demand uh, to buy a, a lot more of uh, school uniform, and then you see, okay, maybe during the term break in March or term break in June, okay, there is a spike again or there is an increase again in terms of demand for school uniform. So it happens, okay, this up and down happens all within a year.
Okay, uh, this is another graph, okay, to explain the, the, the third component in terms of seasonal variation or the seasonality. So, seasonality is a cycle with a period of exactly one year. Okay, we estimate it as a proportion of trend for each season. So, data must be available on seasonal basis. So, we are talking about the four season countries. We must have the winter, spring, summer and autumn. If we are talking about uh, the festive season in Malaysia, okay, the season is not fixed. So, that is not really a good example. Okay, uh, so in this case, the time series decomposition is a method to estimate seasonal component. So you see that the, the dark blue line uh, at the bottom, it shows the seasonal effect only without all the other component. So seasonal effect, okay, you add to that the trend effect or the trend component. Then you have the lighter blue line or the royal blue line, which is both component trend as well as seasonal variation. And okay, if you look at the observation point, the, the black dot, that is your actual observation. So the seasonality or the seasonal components capture regular predictable deviation from the trend. So season can also be not necessarily uh, within a year. It can be like, you know, quarter, I already explained just now, can be weeks or can be days. For example, if you are into um, a psychology or if you are into this human resource thing, if you are to measure productivity, productivity of your staff or, of, or your worker, Usually, when it comes to Monday, uh, supposedly productivity at the highest because you just came back from a good rest on Sunday, okay? And then, okay, you measure that, you know, on Tuesday or on Wednesday, okay, depends whether it's a five days working week or it's a six days working week. And suddenly, okay, you see that on Friday, productivity of the worker usually drops. Why is that? Because everyone look forward for their uh, weekend break. Okay, so those are examples of seasonality that happens within week. So you need to be able to describe whether your week is in terms of 5 days working week, can be in terms of uh, 6 days working week, or it can be okay a season that happens uh, every 3 days is also possible. If you look at the seasonal components, okay, so just remember that seasonality or seasonal component or seasonal variation can be thought of as factors that recur one or more time per year. So this seasonal effect is reasonably stable with respect to timing, direction, and magnitude. So in this case, okay, the example, for example, we have uh, those uh, tourists from the Middle East, okay? So usually, okay, the, there is a large increase in the, uh, the number of tourists from Middle East, okay, at the height of summer, okay? Uh, we are talking about June, July, and August, and Okay, when it comes to October, November, okay, there will be uh, reduced in the number of tourists from the Middle East. So, you can expect that to happen if you are working in the hotel industry, okay, in the tourism sector. You can expect that, okay, every summer, okay, you need to provide for uh, the extra, okay, demand for your hot, uh, hot tourism services, okay, especially from this, uh, tourists from this uh, Middle East. So, the seasonal component of time series comprise of three main types of systematic calendar related influences. Can be seasonal influences, it can be trading day influences. Trading day refer to this uh, stock market uh, trading. Okay, so the stock market traders, okay, basically they work during office, uh, during uh, working days, okay, office hours, okay, they have the starting hours, okay, and then they have the, the closing on specific days, so you have, for example, uh, effect of one particular uh, influences uh, like I do not what I can't remember specifically, but it's called black something. Okay, so it happens. Okay, that is uh, not seasonal. That comes under random components, and then we also have the moving holiday influences. We'll discuss all of these in details. Okay, later when we look at the seasonal component in parts uh, in details. We are still talking about seasonal influences or seasonal variation. So seasonal influences represent intra-year, that means within the year, fluctuation uh, in the series level that are repeated more or less regularly after uh, year after year. So we have warm in the summer, cold in the winter, but weather conditions that are out of character, for example, uh, suddenly uh, we have a flood that occurs out of nowhere. 
Okay, that is something else. But okay, flood in Kelantan and Terengganu in December. That is seasonal influences. You can expect that Kelantan, Terengganu, okay, as well as Johor, they are having flood usually in December because of the monsoon season. Okay, but uh, if we are talking about the four season country, okay, summer is hot month, but suddenly you have snow in London in June. So that is out of character. That is not seasonal influences because that is totally uh, irregular uh, influences. Okay, uh, seasonal influences can be also in terms of uh, traditional uh, to reflect traditional behavior associated with the calendar and the various social. Uh, activities such as Chinese New Year just now or the festivities okay business okay for example when we talk about the uh, income tax revenue departments uh, uh, okay so basically uh, we have I think April 30th April is the closing date okay the due date where everyone is supposed to submit their individual tax uh, payments Okay, what well the company is going, I'm not sure because I do not own a company, but the date for the company to submit their tax payments, okay, their tax uh, form is, uh, uh, I think it's in June or I'm not sure exactly the date. So you will see if you are an accountant, okay, uh, who are doing all this uh, tax thing, you will see that there is a surge in demand for your services as an accountant towards the, uh, towards the due date, okay, uh, for the tax payment things. Okay, when it comes to administrative procedure into a tax return and the effect of Christmas and the holiday season, okay, if we're talking about Christmas, okay, recently ce uh, celebrated as well as the New Year holiday. So this is the time where people in the Western Hemisphere, okay, you, usually they take a long break. So this is time where they go for uh, holidays overseas, okay, the day after Christmas, Boxing Day, you see that Okay, we have companies, okay, offering sales, okay, everywhere in the uh, United States because it's basically the Boxing Day sale. So that is also seasonal influences. So now we have come to the final or the fourth component of time series. Okay, we already discussed the long-term trend. We already discussed the cyclical, the up and down variation as well as the seasonal variation that occurs within a year. So what is random variation? So random variation or the random component is comprising uh, is comprises of the irregular and unpredictable changes in the time series. So it tends to hide the other more predictable component. So you have your graph out and down. Okay, suddenly you have a spike out of nowhere. So that is basically a random variation. For example, if you look at the data for uh, the data for stock exchange or maybe GDP or Okay, uh, for example, and you will have like uh, the September 11, okay, that one will also have effect on the stock exchange and suddenly you have a spike down, okay, suddenly market going down the next day. Okay, so that is random, it doesn't happen uh, regularly, something unexpected. Same thing if we are talking about shooting, okay, uh, or for example, what else, okay, but basically you can find, okay, those that that is not trend, that is not the business cycle, that is not seasonal variation within a year. So if it does not belong to either of these three categories, then it has to be uh, uh, under this random component. The thing is, it has to be irregular and it has to be unpredictable. Okay, so one of our objective at time series analysis is that we want to remove this random component. We want to take out this random variation. Okay, another example that I would like to highlight with regards to the random component of time series, maybe you can look at the impact of the Japanese earthquake, okay, the Japan earthquake that uh, occurred recently on the economy. So, and it also has impact, interestingly, on the nation stock market. You can go to the website and can look at the, uh, the details on the impact of Japanese uh, earthquake, earthquake that happened in Japan, not Japanese earthquake and the impact on the nation stock market. So now, okay, what you, you need to do is put together all the different components of time series. Okay, not that you need to put them together. Basically, what you see is just this line. You do not have the trend line separately. You do not have the seasonal line separately. You do not have the cyclical line separately. What you see is that, okay, when you connect the dots, okay, the dots, uh, the black dot is your actual observation. So when you connect, what you have is the your time series graph. 
So this is the composite model. We do not know okay what are the trend component, the cyclical, the seasonal, or even the random component. So if uh, if there are any residual variation, that is due to the random error. Okay, now let's look back at what you already understand so far. So in terms of the four different component of time series, you already know there are four different uh, sources of variations. Okay, whether it can uh, come from the trend component, the cyclical component, or the seasonal component, or the random parts of the time series. So as you see your data, which is observed over the years, okay, the source of variation can be from uh, either any of these four components, okay, or combination of them. So now what we're going to do next is look at the, how do we tick out the random uh, component in your series. Okay, so there are two methods we are going to look into. One, we'll be talking about moving averages. And number two, we'll be looking at the exponential smoothing. And after that, we'll be talking about a little bit uh, in details about forecasting techniques. Let's talk about smoothing techniques. Okay, if you can determine which component actually exists in a time series, you can then develop a better forecast. And since you know that random variation or random component of time series is something that is unpredictable, which occurs, you know, irregularly. So you need to take out or you need to reduce random variation, okay, by using these smoothing techniques, okay. So you're going to smooth your time series. And the two methods, again, I, I'm going to repeat here, the two methods to smooth your data is either moving averages or you can use exponential smoothing. Let's look at the first method of uh, time series smoothing. So the first one is what we call as moving averages. So from the word averages, that move. Okay, so a moving average for a time period is simply the arithmetic means of the values in that time period and those close to it. So this is where you can always hear something like a three year moving average for a yearly time series or in terms of seven days moving average for a five day working weeks okay and it can be seven days moving average and so on and so forth so how does it work okay let's look at the tables okay the one that you see on screen so you have the okay um time period okay instead of having year days or months okay uh let's put it uh, in such that you know you have the first time period the second the third the fourth and the fifth and then you have data observation in terms of sales revenue in terms of thousands Okay, so the first time period is 39,000, the second one is 37, the third one is 60, 61, the fourth one is 58, and then you have 18, and then you have the rest. Okay, so this is for example 20.1. So how do you calculate a uh, moving average? So let's say you know that you need to calculate a 3-year moving average. So in this case, what you need to do is take out the first uh, 3 data observation. Okay, you add them up, okay, and because you add 3, then you need to divide by 3. So that is the first uh, calculation for the 3-year moving average. So what you need to do is take out 39, okay, add to that 37, and then you add 61, okay, because 3 items you add together, then you need to divide by 3. So the first uh, moving average value is what uh, you get at the end, 45.7, okay, and then you need to move. Okay, when you move to the next year, okay, so just now you calculate the first three moving average, so you get one value, okay, then you leave out the first value, which is 39, okay, you still uh, retain 37 as well as 61, okay, remember you are calculating three year moving average, so because of that, you need to add the next uh, data value, which is 58 to your uh, calculation, so you have 37 plus 61 plus 58, three values, so you need to divide by three, so you get a new moving average that is 52, okay? And the next, okay, uh, same thing, you leave out 37, okay, now you have 61, and still you have 58, it's only two observation, so you need to find the, the next observation, which is 18, add them all together, divide by three, so you get the next moving averages. So you do that up to the point where you have no more three observation, you cannot move anymore. Okay, once you have your moving averages, then you can plot those values on your graph, okay, and, you, and then you can see the difference between the actual data that you observe as well as your moving averages. So the one in blue, okay, the up and down that you can see is the actual data, okay, while the one in red is the 
uh, the one that you uh, you calculated okay using the moving averages method so in this case you can take note how that moving averages has smoothened okay your raw data remember your raw data in blue it has a jagged surface okay up and down so now if you compare to that okay with the one in red so your new moving averages line okay they are less jagged okay so it's basically smoother okay in terms of interpreting moving averages okay the averaging process will remove some of the random variation not all okay so if you use okay we are talking about the same data that we talked about uh, earlier uh, we are talking about example 20.1 okay so if you use the five quarter moving averages that will remove even more variation and your line will be smoother okay but okay if you compare with the one that uh, you have in three uh, three um, three quarter movie averages or three year movie averages okay you have lost the seasonality that appear okay so let's look back okay in terms of your raw data in blue so you have that jagged surface and then you have the one in red which is a three year or three quarter um moving averages and then you compare to that with the one in green five quarter moving averages so the five quarter or the five year moving average is smoother compared to the three year or three quarter moving averages so in this case okay uh, you need to know uh, you need to determine beforehand whether you are going to use three quarter or three uh, uh, year moving averages instead of five quarter or five year moving averages Okay, just now when we talk about moving averages, okay, it's easier for you to see that when you have three uh, year moving average, okay, the value, okay, for that average will fall right in the middle of that three observation. Same thing if we are talking about five year or five quarter moving averages, then you have the value of that uh, uh, five year observation of average will fall on the middle observation. But what if you have an even number of time period? Okay, so in that case, you need to consider the centered moving average. We are still talking about the same method moving average. Now you need to center it. Okay, you need to put it in the middle if they, if they do not fall in the middle. Okay, so we have considered the moving averages for odd number of time period. Okay, the one that I shown earlier. So in this case, we need to consider what happened when you use an even number of period to calculate moving averages. So let's uh, do that next. So when we talk about centered moving average, okay, with an even number of observation included in the moving average, the average will be placed between the two period right in the middle. Okay, just bear in mind if you're talking about two values, so the average will fall right in the middle of the two values if we are talking about you have four quarters in a year so the average of four quarter will fall somewhere between quarter two and quarter three of that particular year so in that case to replace or to place the moving average in terms of an actual time period you need to center it okay how you do that okay the two conservative moving averages are centered by taking their averages and placing it in the middle between them Okay, so it's difficult to see, okay, we are discussing it now, but I'm going to show you in the table next. Okay, let's look at this example on centered moving average. As I told you earlier, we are talking about, okay, an even number of uh, observation. So we are talking either about four quarter in a year, or we are talking about six days working weeks, okay, and anything else that involve, for example, 12 months in a year. So in this case, okay, we are talking about even number of observation, okay. So in this case, we are going to consider six period time series. So you have your actual data observed, okay. We have 15 in the first period, 27 in the second period, 20 in the third period, 14 next, 25 and 11. In this case, okay, you are supposed to calculate a four period moving averages something like four quarter moving averages okay what uh, okay why do we need to calculate moving averages bear in mind okay because we want to smooth your data we want to smoothen your time series okay how do we calculate this so you see that okay each observation in your time series belong to a certain time period okay 15 is on the time period number one 27 is in time period number two 
20 is time period number 3. So if you calculate, okay, in the third column, okay, the 4 period moving average, okay, you need to add 15 plus 27 plus 20 plus 14, add them together and you divide by 4. Why divide by 4 instead of dividing by 3? Because this is a 4 quarter or 4 period moving average. Just now, okay, uh, it's a 3 year or 3 period moving average. We divide by 3. Now, you will have 4 quarter. You add 4, you divide by 4. So, you should get the first uh, moving average, 4 period moving average value of 19. Okay. Now, the question is, this 19 will fall in place right in between uh, the second and the third period. It does not belong to the second period. It does not belong to the third line. Okay, it falls in between the second and the third line. Okay, so in that case, what you need to do is, okay, I, I leave it for the time being. Okay, let's look at the next calculation of moving averages. Okay, so now, okay, you start with 15. Okay, now you take out 15. So you still have 27. You have 20. You have 14. Three values. Add them together and add to that 25. Okay, again, you divide... Okay, this with 4, so you should get the next moving averages value 21.5. Okay, so that is also a fall in between the third and the fourth quarter right in the middle. Okay, not on the third line, not on the fourth line, but in, the, in between the third and the fourth line. Okay, or between the third and the fourth time period. So the next moving averages, okay, you, you leave out 27, you still have 20, 14, 25. Now you add to that 11, okay, and now you divide by 4, so you should get the third moving averages value which is 17.5, okay. Because they are not center, okay, so be, uh, because of that, you need to introduce the, the, the next column, the fourth column, this is where you have your centered moving average, okay. What you need to do is simply take up the two value in the moving averages, so in this case, you have 19, Okay, you add to 21.5, okay, because you add uh, these two value, then you need to divide by 2 because the word average. Then you have a new value which is 20.25 that will fall exactly on the third time period, okay, on the third line. Okay, same thing when we talk about uh, the next, uh, okay, value, okay, you take up 21.5, okay, four period moving average. You add to that 17.5 because you add these two, you divide by two. So you should get the next four period centered moving average value of 19.5 that will fall exactly on the fourth period line. So basically that is the difference between uh, centered moving average for even number time series compared to the old time series that we already seen earlier. Okay, similar to hypothesis testing where you have five different steps. Okay, when it comes to time series decompositions, in order for you to take out all the different components of time series, okay, so in this case, you start with your raw data, which is known as your uh, Y, okay. After that, you need to estimate your seasonal indices, okay. So in this case, okay, what you need to do is compute your base trend using the center moving average or, set, uh, or just moving averages. So what you calculate just now are going to be known later, Okay, we're going to label that as T prime. So T with that symbol is what we call as T prime. So that is your trend, okay, which is basically your uh, centered moving average column for the uh, even number observation, while the uh, odd number will be just your moving averages column. Okay, after you compute your base trend, then you need to estimate your seasonal ratio. Okay, how you calculate your seasonal ratio? Simply take, okay, the ratio of the actual observation Y, okay, over your uh, T prime, okay, your centered moving average. After that, you need to take the average of this seasonal ratio so that you can get your raw seasonal indices. And after that, you need to normalize so that eventually you came up with your final seasonal indices, okay, we label that as S. Okay, and the next step, okay, you need to de-seasonalize your raw data using S that you already calculated, your seasonal indices just now. What you need to do is take your observation, okay, your Y divided by your S, 
Okay, after that you can estimate the trend equations using the de-seasonalized data and you can make your forecast, okay? So your forecast will label as Y prime equals to your trend value multiply with your seasonal indices and from there you can calculate the error by taking your Y minus the uh, forecast value of Y. Now let's discuss one example in terms of how do we model this trend and seasonality. Okay, so uh, on the left hand side of the screen, you can see a table. So you have the time period, okay, uh, the period number 1 up to period number 20. Okay, basically that referred to the first year 1992 up to the last year that is being observed 1996. Okay, we are talking about 4 years but data are being observed, okay, quarterly. So you have quarter 1, quarter 2, quarter 3, quarter 4 for 1992. Okay, and then you have the same quarter 1 to quarter 4 for 1993, 1994, 1995, and 1996. And then your Y, okay, your uh, dependent variable, the one that we are talking about is revenue. Okay, so revenue for the first quarter in 1992 up to the uh, fourth quarter in 1996. And then you can uh, plug it in into the computer and you can click your time series graph. Okay, so you'll be able to get in this case, okay, this is your times uh, in terms of uh, something like scattered diagram, okay, not yet uh, connected in terms of the observation. So you see that, okay, this is how your uh, revenue, in this case, we are talking about example for Toys R Us uh, revenue in million uh, pound, uh, in millions uh, uh, dollar. So you have all those points, okay, the up and down shows the variation over the four quarter over the four years okay remember okay the first step that you need to do is to calculate your t prime your t prime is basically referring to your moving averages and remember your time series that is being observed are in terms of even number observation that is four quarter in a year so because of that okay basically you will need to do the centered moving average step later so let's look back okay uh, the first step where you need to calculate your moving averages okay so you add one new column okay next to the revenue column so what you need to do now is add the first four observation 1026 plus 1056 plus 1182 as well as 2861 add these four observation and divide by four you should be able to get a new average of 1531.3 Okay, so bear in mind, okay, this one, this 1,531.3 is, uh, is not actually uh, fall on the period 3 line. It's actually in between period 2 and period 3. Okay, but it's, uh, it's not so nice. Okay, if I were to put it right on the line, it's difficult to do in tables as well. So bear in mind, okay, this is not, uh, this is not yet centered. Okay, so we leave that for the time being. Okay, let's continue with the calculation of your moving average. Okay, so now you take up the first quarter of 1992, which is 1026. Okay, you still continue with the three quarter of 1992. Now you add to that, okay, the first quarter of 1993, which is 1172. So you divide by four, so you should get the next moving average value, 1567.8. And you do the same thing, okay, uh, in terms of moving averages for the next four quarters, so on and so forth. Okay, you already calculate the four quarter moving averages, but remember your data now is an even number observation, four quarter in a year. And the moving average that you already calculated, okay, for example, you have the first moving average that you uh, calculate is 1,531.3. So that one is actually belong to uh, you should put you should uh, put it in between uh, quarter two and quarter three or between period two and period three. So it's not uh, belong does not belong to the exact line. So because of that, what you need to do is uh, you add another column next to the moving average column. So you level that as a centered moving average, and then how you fill in this centered moving average. So you take the first two value of the moving average, divide by two, then okay, you what you get is the centered moving average. Okay, so that's this will fall exactly on the third quarter or the third period of that year. Okay, and you do the same thing in the next observation. 
Okay, we have done the T prime. Okay, remember what is T prime? T prime is referring to your moving averages. Okay, in the case of even number, you need to calculate your centered moving averages. Next, what you need to do is to compute your seasonal ratios. Okay, the first step is where you need to add another column next to the centered moving average. Okay, for the seasonal ratio. And you simply take, okay, your actual value, the Y that you observe for that particular quarter. So in this case, we are talking about Y equals to 1182. And you divide, okay, your Y with your T prime, which is the trend value. Okay, so you will get a new ratio, which is called a seasonal ratio. So 1182 divided by 1549.5, that will give you a seasonal ratio of 0.7628 okay and then you do the same thing for the next line okay you take 2861 divided by center moving average of 1591.9 you get a seasonal ratio of 1.7973 and you do the, the rest of the uh, observation in the same way okay in the current step this is where you calculate your raw seasonal indices Okay, just now in the earlier step, what you calculate is just the seasonal ratios. So you do that for all the observation where you have your trend value or your centered moving averages. So when it comes to calculating your seasonal indices, what you need to do is, okay, you add all the seasonal ratio, okay, for that, in this case, we're talking about quarter one first. Okay, so you find the seasonal ratio for all quarter one. So in this case, we have the first quarter one seasonal ratio that you can observe is in period five. That is for 1993, okay, quarter one, okay, seasonal ratio of 0.7162. Okay, and then you have the, the next uh, quarter one seasonal ratio, which is in 1994, in period nine, okay, in the ninth line, which is 0.6949. Okay, and then you also have the first quarter value seasonal ratio for 1995 as well as the first quarter ratios for 1996. So the one that I circle in red is the first quarter value for 1993, 1994, 95 and 96. You need to calculate the average ratio. So you add all these four seasonal ratio together, divide by four. So what you get now is the raw seasonal index for quarter one, which is equals to 0.7135. Okay, as for the quarter two, okay, what you need to do is the same thing as you, what you did earlier. Okay, you need to find all the quarter two seasonal ratios. So in this case, uh, you look at, uh, you do not have a second quarter seasonal ratio in 1992, but you do have in 1993 the value of 0.7242. And then you have in 1994, the second uh, quarter seasonal ratio of 0.6742. And then in 1995, the value is uh, 0.6760. And in 1996, the second quarter seasonal ratio of 0.7424. Uh, you add this 4, divide by 4. So you should get the raw seasonal index for quarter 2. Okay, so you can wrote that as 0.7077. Okay, so this is another column next to the seasonal ratio. This is your seasonal index. Okay, and then you do that for quarter three and quarter four. So basically when it comes to four quarter observation, then you will have four seasonal indices only. Okay, you can leave all the rest of the uh, space or the rest of the column empty. The same thing when you calculate moving average. Okay, just now we calculate the four quarter moving average. Of course, the first two uh, column will be uh, uh, will be empty, and the last two column will be empty as well. You do not need to fill in those column. Okay, same thing when you uh, when you calculate seasonal ratio. Okay, because no centered moving average for the first two quarter and the last two quarter. So there is also no seasonal ratio for the first two quarter and the last two quarter. So this is something that you need to take note because this is. Uh, what points out to the disadvantages of using uh, moving averages method later. I will discuss that. Okay, now let's look at the next step, which is for you to normalize your seasonal indices. Okay, so this is where you need to add another column, but don't worry about that. Okay, why you need to normalize your seasonal indices, the one, uh, the four quarter seasonal index that you 
already calculated just now. Okay, you need to normalize to make sure that your seasonal indices average to 1.0. So in this case, uh, okay, or it can be uh, add up to 4 in this case. So the one that you have, 0.7135, okay, that is first quarter seasonal index. 0.7077, that is the second quarter seasonal index. And then 0.7406, that's the third quarter seasonal index. Okay, and then you have the fourth quarter seasonal index, 1.8444. So in this case, what you need to do is, okay, uh, in order to normalize, you take this value, okay, the first quarter value, which is uh, 0.7135, you divide by the addition of all these four uh, quarter seasonal index, okay, so seasonal index, uh, indices. So in this case, you how do you normalize? You take the first quarter value, which is 0.7135, you divide that with 0.7135 plus 0.7077 plus 0.7406 plus 1.8444. Okay, so you take a new ratio. Okay, so after normalize, what you get is for the first quarter value. Okay, the seasonal indices after normalize become 0.7124. Okay, you do the same thing for the second quarter seasonal index. Okay, uh, instead of 0.7135, now you replace that with 0.7077 divided by the addition of all four quarter seasonal indices. So you get a new value which is 0.706. Okay, and for the third quarter, when you normalize, that means you take the 0.7406 divided by the addition of all four quarter seasonal indices. So you should get 0.7394. And the fourth quarter, similarly, you take 1.84444, we divide by the addition of all four quarters in the indices. So what you get is 1.8415. Okay, so if you look at the final column on the right-hand side column, okay, seasonal indices, SI, after normalized, it becomes, okay, um, uh, the value that you calculate is being repeated Okay, the same four quarter is being repeated over the years. So you see 0.7124, okay, the seasonal index for quarter one in 1992 is similar to uh, seasonal index, okay, for 1993, still 0.7124, similar to quarter one in 1994, okay, and similar to quarter one in 1995 and 1996. Actually, you can skip this column, uh, okay, once you have done the calculation. But, okay, I want to show to you, okay, basically when you calculate the seasonal index, okay, basically, okay, you take the average of all the seasonal ratio, okay, then, and then you normalize, okay, and then you make sure they add up to 4, and then you have the same index over the years. So, that's why we call it seasonal index. In this case, it's more than one values, seasonal indices. The next step that we are looking into is what we call as the de-seasonalizing your raw data. Okay, that means we, we want to take out the seasonal component. So once you already calculate your seasonal index, okay, you already have that column. Okay, this is where you need to add another column. Okay, bear in mind, okay, the calculation looks tedious, but okay, just bear with me. Okay, this is uh, what you need to do manually. But if we are talking about a large data set, okay, don't worry. You can just plug it in into the computer, the software. Okay, whether we are talking about Minitab or any other software or add into Excel, they will be able to do all uh, the steps that we, we have covered so far. Okay, let's look back uh, at this de-seasonalized column. Okay, so once you have your seasonal index, for quarter one and then quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. To take out the season, okay, the de seasonalize means you take out the season. Okay, what you need to do is uh, take your observation, okay, your Y for that particular period, which is 1026, you divide by your uh, seasonal index, which is 0.7124. So you should get a new value, which is 1440.2. Okay, so this is what we label as Y prime. Okay, Y prime is the seasonalized value. So for the second period, same thing, you take your actual observation, sales revenue of 1056, you divide by the 
you divide with the seasonal index for quarter two, which is 0 0.7066. So you should get a deseasonalized value. Okay, your Y prime equals to 1494. So you do the rest for all the observation. So take note, okay, for this deseasonalized column, okay, you must fit in all the uh, row upon row. Okay, even though you do not have the centered moving average, you do not have the T prime column, okay, for the first two quarter and the last two quarter. But once you calculate the average seasonal ratio, okay, and normalize become seasonal index, then you can fit in all the column in terms of deseasonalized values. Okay, so remember, deseasonalized, in this case, what you need to do is simply take your actual observation, divide by the seasonal index. If you were to plug in, okay, the deseasonalized uh, value just now into your computer, okay, into the software, okay, this is what you get in terms of uh, your graphs, okay. So the red dots is your actual observations, okay. Uh, the red dot is actually your uh, deseasonalized values and you can fit a regression line to this deseasonalized observation, okay, basically to give you a, a, a regression equations. Okay, you take note, the red dot is the decimal value is very much smoother compared to the actual observation with a jagged up and down. Okay, now back to our table. Okay, we're still talking about decimalizing your data. Okay, so based on the plots that you, you have seen earlier, okay, where you, you plot your decimalized values, okay, for all the uh, quarters over the years from 1992 up to 1996, and then you can fit a regression line, okay? You don't have to do that manually, okay? You just uh, click the appropriate steps, okay, in the computers. And then you get your regression line, so you have your regression equations, okay? Your, your model, okay? So in this case, in order for you to forecast, okay? You can use the regression model that you, came, uh, that you, uh, you came up with in order to do forecast. In this case, okay, how you get that forecast value, okay? Since we know that... Your regression equation is, uh, the intercept is 1,373.4 plus the slope which is 56.93 and multiply with T. In this case, your T is, we are talking about period 1, okay? So, you don't put uh, the T as 1992, okay? Because that will make, uh, uh, that will simply is too large, okay? Because we are talking about what you observe is for this, uh, set of data, so your T, okay, for 1992 quarter 1 is simply the first period that you observe. So you put that as your X. So remember, X in time series is always time. X is not another variable. X is time. So in this case, okay, the slope of your regression model, 56.93, multiply with 1, okay, plus the intercept just now, 1373.4. So you should get Okay, your decentralized value 1430, which is quite close. Okay, uh, your forecast value 1430.3, which is quite close to your decentralized value of 1440.2. So it, that means when it comes to actual forecasting, okay, okay, you see how close is the forecast value for the first period, okay, the first quarter of 1992. Okay, you compare the forecast value with the decentralized value. So that means, okay, you can use this, for example, if you want to know what is the forecast value for the first quarter in 1997. So 1997 is period 21. Okay, so in that case, 56.93 multiply with 21 plus the intercept value of 1373.4. So whatever value that is forecast value for quarter one in 1997. If you're talking about quarter two in 1997, okay, you move down. So you know that is period 22. So you replace your X, okay, your time as 22 multiply and you add up the intercept. So you should get the forecast value for 1997 quarter two. So basically, this is the use of decentralizing your time series. Okay, you take out okay uh, the seasonal uh, variations. Okay, and you can use it to uh, to make your forecast, which is quite close to the decentralized value of the actual data. 
Okay, we are going to discuss the forecast that you did just now. Okay, your forecast is already de-seasonalized. So in this case, let's look back. Uh, let's look at the four uh, quarter in 1997. That is period 21, 22, 23, and 24, which is basically unknown because your data stopped at 1996, the fourth quarter. So in this case, you already forecast. Okay, using the model that you uh, came up with. So you should uh, get the value, the forecast value in for, uh, for quarter 1, 1997, that is period 21, okay, just now is 2,568.9. And then you have, okay, the forecast value for the 22nd quarter uh, period or the second quarter of 1997, which is 2,625.9. And then you have the third quarter forecast value 2,684.8. And then you do have the fourth quarter in 1997, okay, forecast value of 2,739.7. So you see that basically you have a, a, an increasing trend because this is forecast, okay, that is after de-seasonalized, okay. And in all, because you know that, you know, there are up and down, okay, over the quarters, okay, over the years, okay. Uh, in this case, you need to re-seasonalize your data, Okay, just now you take out the season, okay, you do your forecast, okay, you do your estimates, okay, in the, for the unknown quarters in, uh, in the unknown, uh, okay, in the next observation. But you must remember the four quarters act differently. So in this case, how you re-seasonalize, bring back the effect of season, okay, what you need to do is simply multiply your seasonal index with your forecasted uh, value for that particular period. So in this case, okay, the first quarter for 1997, that is period 21, you get 2,568.9 multiply with seasonal index of 0.724. So what you get is the re-seasonalized value. Take into account the effect of season, the value is actually much lower Okay, the forecast value now become 1,830.2. Okay, and okay, you do the same thing for the second, the third, and the fourth quarter. And remember just now, okay, in terms of forecast value is increasing, slowly increasing. But after re-seasonalizing, that means after taking into account, okay, the, uh, the effect of season. Uh, for example, we are talking about period 24, that is the fourth quarter of 1997. Okay, you take the forecast uh, value of 2,739.7, multiply with seasonal index of 1.84153. Uh, so the re value is actually very much higher, 5,045.3. So this is your final forecast value after taking into account, okay, the effect of season. Okay, now, okay, you can plug in your forecast value, okay, into the software and you see what uh, your computer will come up with okay so remember the blue dotted okay line is basically your actual observation of why we are talking about sales revenue for toys R Us. okay and then you connect the points so you see the jagged up and down over the quarter over the years okay and you see beyond uh, the the 20th period so we are talking about the 21st period 22nd 23rd 24th Okay, that one is not available. The data is not available, but you already made the forecast. You plug them in. So now what you have a continuation of your uh, time series. So that is a forecast value and it looks more or less acceptable because it follows the same wavy pattern. And this is the plot of the forecast where you might take the multiplication, your trend value. Okay, multiply with your season. Okay, now we are going to add another column. Okay, this is for you to uh, to calculate the square error. So remember, what when you forecast, okay, there's a possibility that you make mistake. Okay, so you want to know, okay, uh, uh, the variance, okay, in terms of how far, uh, okay, from the actual value perhaps, okay, uh, in terms of your forecast. So because of that, we have this new column that we call as the square error. So nothing new, okay, okay, this is more or less the same formula for variance, okay. What you need to do is take your actual data, okay, your Y, in this case we are talking about revenue for the first period, 1026, 
okay and uh, you have your for uh, your forecasted value just now okay you do that for all observation from from period one up to period 20 okay uh, not the, the the actual forecast for period 21 up to period 24 but for the actual observation okay so in this case you take the difference between uh, the Y, okay, in terms of sales revenue and the re seasonalized forecast, okay, of 1018.983. So, okay, and then as usual, you need to square the different, okay. So, this one, okay, what you observe, okay, in terms of 1026, that's the actual values, and what you forecast in using the step that we already did just now is the re seasonalized forecast. Okay, the square will give the emphasis to those value that is bigger, okay, compared to those value that is smaller. So that's why when you calculate variance, you, okay, you always square because that will give the weightage, okay, accordingly. So in this case, for period one, okay, uh, the difference is uh, after you square, you get a difference of 97, okay, and you do the same for period two up to the last period. Okay, and uh, as another thing, measure of goodness of fit, you need to calculate root, mean, square, error. Okay, so you already have the square error, the difference between the actual observation and the re seasonal line forecast. Okay, so you add all of them. Okay, so you add the square error column. Okay, so you have 9,865.2. 9, so that is the total uh, square error okay so in this case uh, divide by uh, after you divide with 20 uh, observation okay then you take the square root so it become your root mean square error okay so remember the steps okay calculate the difference between the actual observation and the re season line forecast you take uh, you square it you add all of them together and, and then you divide by the number of period 20 and then you take the square root so it become root mean square error of 99.3 okay let's look back at what we already discussed so far in terms of seasonally adjusted okay and we compare that with original series okay original time series so what you have on screen is industrial production index okay we're talking about the original series on the left hand side of the screen and the, the seasonally adjusted series on the right hand side of the screen so we're talking about four countries okay armenia germany serbia and ukraine okay this is the example from uh, available given okay in the textbook okay don't ask me why okay these four countries why not malaysia okay you can find the same uh, industrial production index for malaysia okay separate uh, diagram perhaps okay if you look at the original series Okay, what you see is uh, quite confusing and you cannot tell. Okay, if you are talking about this four country comparison, you do not know which one, okay, which is doing better in terms of their production output. Is it Armenia? Is it Germany? Is it Serbia? Is it Ukraine over the years? Okay, because what you have is the up and down. Okay, over the years, okay, have, it's like uh, they, they are crisscrossing each other. Sometimes, okay, uh, Germany in yellow is higher than all the other three countries okay but over the years we have Serbia the one in light blue sky blue is uh, overtaking the uh, all these countries and then you also have the Armenia uh, Ukraine in the deep purple maroonish okay uh, towards the final series overtaking the other countries okay so that is the original series okay not much you can gain by looking at this graph okay on the right hand side of the screen this is after you suddenly adjusted your time series so in this case you see a smoother line okay and it gives a clearer picture in terms of the industrial production index for these four country over the year okay in terms of monthly series of industrial production index so you see that uh, the armenia so this is uh, one of the countries in the eastern europe so they consistently okay uh, stay at the bottom okay among these four countries while you see that ukraine is overtaking okay the more developed uh, country like germany as well as the serbia okay after the post war okay now we are going to look at the questions why okay we need to seasonally adjust your time series 
Okay, it has three purpose. Whatever that we did, all the different okay uh, columns, okay calculation so far. Okay, first is to aid in short term forecasting. Okay, this uh, seasonally adjusted time series will also help you in terms of relating time series to other time series or extreme event, especially when uh, okay when uh, this include comparison of time series from uh, different countries like what I already shown and discussed with you earlier with regards to Germany. Armenia, okay, Ukraine and Serbia, okay. And another reason for uh, for you to seasonally adjust your time series is that to allow the series to be compared from month to month, quarter to quarter. Okay, when we talk about seasonal adjustment, it's just an analysis technique that estimate and then remove from a series influences that are systematic and calendar related. So remember when we talk about the seasonal component. Okay, all the variation that happens within a year, whether we are talking about changes in weather or we are talking about the, the festive season. Okay, so those are calendar related. It happens within a year, but it's systematic. Okay, you can expect Chinese New Year, okay, early in the year and you can expect Christmas, okay, late in the year. Okay, same thing with summer, okay, winter and so on. And a uh, seasonally adjusted series can be formed by removing the systematic calendar related influences from the original time series. Okay, so this is the uh, de seasonalized part. Okay, and then a, a trend series is then derived by removing the remaining irregular influences from the seasonally adjusted series. Okay, in case you are still not clear about what we did so far in terms of, you know, all this designalized, resignalized, okay, seasonal adjustment. So, this is another definition which I take from the Bundesbank. Okay, the aim of seasonal adjustment is to eliminate seasonal and working day effect. Hence, there are no seasonal and working day effect in a perfectly seasonal, seasonally adjusted series. So, remember when we talk about working day effect. So, remember I already shared with you. Uh, the example okay about productivity at work okay so when it comes to a five day working weeks okay monday you know everyone you know feel like oh it's monday you have the monday blues productivity is slow okay and slowly picking up on tuesday wednesday and by friday or even uh, thursday evening productivity is already going down because everyone is looking forward to the weekend break so that is the working day effect so if you take out this seasonal effect into a working day effect, then you can have the actual production without the effect of lower or higher productivity due to the different days in a week. So in other words, seasonal adjustment transforms the world that we live in into a world where there is no seasonal and working day effects. Okay, in a seasonally adjusted world, the temperature is exactly the same in winter as in the summer. There are no holidays, Christmas is abolished, people work every day in the week with the same intensity. Okay, no break over the weekend and so on and so forth. Okay, now we are going to look uh, to look into the industrial production index, the time series of industrial production index for Kazakhstan. This is for the year 2002, January. Okay, it's a monthly uh, index, okay, values, okay, from January 2002 up to May 2007, more than five years, so quite a long uh, series. So, you ha you see the actual observation in terms of RPI of Kazakhstan, okay, the jagged blue line, okay, so that is the actual series. And then you see the trend in terms of yellow, okay, quite difficult to see. And then you have the seasonally adjusted uh, time series, okay, the one in pink. What we already discussed earlier is the multiplicative model of time series. Okay, there's another possibility that you need to consider that perhaps, okay, your uh, seasonally uh, adjusted time series could be in terms of additive model. How do you know whether your model, okay, in terms of seasonal adjustment, whether it's going to be additive or it's going to be multiplicative? Okay, the trick is, if you sketch your time series, okay, uh, over the years, okay, you have the time series graph, okay, if your uh, graph is like blowing or explosive, okay, that is a clue for you to do the multiplicative model. But if the up and down over the years, okay, the trend might be increasing, but the peak and the low period remain more or less the same over the years, that is a clue for you to actually use the additive model. So remember, when it comes to the um, 
average uh, seasonal indices okay the multiplicative model it should add up equals to 4 the active additive model okay seasonal indices later you see that it should equals to 0 we are going to see why next okay so in this example you have data for 2006 to 2009 it's a quarterly data quarter 1 to quarter 4 for 2006 up to 2009 you are still talking we are still talking about sales, okay, let's name it A, or just now, okay, it should be Y, okay, in 1000 Ringgit Malaysia, okay. So, in this case, you need to calculate the moving average, okay, because it's a four quarter, it's understood, you need to calculate the four quarter moving average. Okay, remember the steps, okay, take the first four quarter value, that is 28, plus 36, plus 47, plus 19, and because you add 4, you divide by 4. So that will give you the first moving average value, which is 32.5. So remember, 32.5 is actually belong to the line between second and third quarter of 2006. It's not actually on that uh, second quarter line. Okay, so just bear that in mind. It's much easier if you, are to, if you have space in between the line. That means you have another empty column, empty row in between quarter 1 and quarter 2 so that you can put 32.5 there. Okay, same thing between quarter 2 and quarter 3, between quarter 3 and quarter 4. That means you have, okay, all these extra rows, okay? And then remember how you calculate the next moving average. You leave out the first quarter value 28, okay? And because you take out quarter 1, 2006, then you need to add to that quarter 1 of 2007. So you add 36 plus 47 plus 19 plus 33, okay, add 4, then you divide by 4, you should get the next moving average value of 33.75. And you do the rest until the last point where there is no more 4 quarter that you can calculate. Okay, the next column that you need to calculate because this is an even uh, quarter, okay, period. So because of that, you need to calculate the centered moving average. So in this case, simply they take the first two moving average, add two together, divide by two. So you get, okay, the sum type moving average, 33.125, which fall exactly on the third quarter of 2006. Okay, same thing, okay, the next um, sum type moving average, 33.75 plus 35, divide by two, you get sum type moving average of 34.375, and you do the rest, Okay. So in this case, for you to calculate trend, okay, uh, for you to calculate your seasonal variations, okay, seasonal uh, index, uh, seasonal ratio, uh, not ratio in this uh, in this case, okay, because this is additive model. So in order for you to find the seasonal component, take your actual observation. In this case, I label as A, but it should be Y, okay, and you deduct that with your a centered moving average, your T prime, or here I label as capital T. So in this case, 47 minus centered moving average value of 33.125. So you get a different seasonal component of 13.875. Then 19 minus 34.375 seasonal component in the fourth quarter of 2006, negative 15.375. Okay, and then you do uh, the rest in terms of the calculation. Just take note when it comes to uh, manual calculation of all these re-signalized, de-signalized, centered moving average, I would encourage all of you to maintain at least four decimal places. Do not round up your figure yet. Okay, you only round up your figures only at the end. For example, when you have the normalized seasonal index. Okay, at this stage where you are calculating moving average, centered moving average, your seasonal component, you do not round up. Okay, please maintain, okay, in this case, three decimal places is still acceptable. Okay, uh, if possible, try to maintain four decimal places. So, in additive model, okay, the seasonal component is by taking out the centered moving average value from the actual observation. So that's the difference between additive model as compared to multiplicative model that we already discussed earlier. Okay, the next step in this additive model is similar to what we already did in the multiplicative model. So we need to uh, to get the seasonal index for the four different quarter. We need to normalize them. 
Okay, so instead of they add up to 4, we are going to make sure that they add, uh, okay, add up equals to 0. Why? Because it's additive model. Okay, because we have the positive, we have the negative. Okay, they should offset each other. They should uh, end up with 0. Okay, so this one is just a, an adjustment of the table so that it's make it easier for you to calculate the additive model. Okay, so for this particular table, okay, in order for you to calculate the seasonal index or the seasonal factor, okay, you fill in the uh, seasonal component just now, okay. In this case, you do not have the value for the first and the second quarter of 2006. Let them be, okay, ignore that, okay, leave the, the, uh, the, the column, okay, empty, uh, the row, uh, okay, empty. The same thing, you do not have the third quarter and the fourth quarter for 2009. It's okay, just put that as a dash or you can put it in A, which means not available, okay. So now, okay, you have 2006 row, 2007, 2008, 2009 and the respective quarter value in terms of seasonal uh, component okay then you add one column we call that the total column okay so in this case how do you get the total for quarter one okay you add out all quarter one uh, seasonal uh, value component okay for the years that you have the data so in this case you do not have quarter one uh, seasonal component for 2006 it's not available so what you have only for 2007 up to 2009 so add all of those together so negative 2.625 plus negative 5.25 plus negative 6.5, you should get a total for quarter one is 14.375. Okay, because it's total of three. So when it come to average row, okay, this negative 14.375 is a total of three quarter values. So you need to divide by three. 14 divided by three, you should get negative 4.7917. And you do the same for the quarter two. You add 3.875 plus 4.75 plus 5.625 positive value. So you, you get 14.25. 14.25 divided by 3, you get average of 4.75. For quarter three, you add 13.875 plus 13.625 plus 12.5. You should get a total of 40. Divide by 3, you get average of 13.33. As for quarter 4, you add up negative 15.375 plus negative 13.625 plus negative 11.825. You get a total of negative 40.875. Divide by 3, you should get negative 13.625. For this additive model or even multiplicative model, the negative and positive positive signs remain important. Okay, do not take out the positive and negative figure. Okay, so now you have this four quarter average value of seasonal component. Okay, so you need to add all of these four quarter uh, seasonal component together and make sure whether does it equals to zero. So in this case, okay, uh, you can see on the right hand side of the screen where you have negative 4.79167, okay, which is the first quarter average, okay, and then plus 4.75, the second quarter average, plus 13.333, the third quarter average seasonal component, plus negative 13.625, the fourth quarter seasonal component. When you add all of this together, it looks like more or less they are set, but actually there are differences of negative 0.33, okay? So there are differences of negative 0.33, okay? This one you need to divide by 4, okay? Negative uh, 0.33 divided by 4, you should get, okay, the one uh, a single figure on the right-hand side, okay? Furthermore, is negative 0.08, so this negative 0 0.08, you need to bring back into the table. That will be the adjustment value for all four quarter. Okay, because the difference is negative. So in this case, okay, you have um, a negative uh, average of quarter one, negative 4.79. Okay, and then you have this adjustment value of negative 0 0.08. So you take your average, you minus, because minus minus 0 0.08 become positive. So you end up with your seasonal value of 4.70. You do the same thing for the second and the third and the fourth quarter. Okay? So that is the adjusted seasonal factors. And finally, 
Okay, after you did that, okay, to make sure that day equals to zero, then only you round up, okay, your figure, your in terms of seasonal component. So the first quarter seasonal factor instead of negative 4.7, now you can say it's negative 5. Okay, and then for quarter 2, okay, it's a positive 5. Okay, and then quarter 3 is 13. Okay, and quarter 4 is negative 13. It should be that, you know, mathematically negative 13.5 in quarter 4 should be round up as negative 14. Okay, it should be the rule of rounding up more than 0.5, it goes uh, one unit. But in this case, because we want to make sure, okay, your seasonal factor offset each other. They should equals to 0 at the end. So negative 5 balance with 5, settled. So 13 should balance with negative 13 to offset each other. So that's why negative 13.5 is not rounding, is not round up to negative 14. Instead, we round it down to negative 13. So this is again a repeat of the multiplicative model that we already did. This uh, okay in terms of we discussed in details. Okay, so now in simpler term, you see that you know uh, you have your actual observation. We're talking about production for uh, four quarter in three year. You calculate the moving average. Okay, the sun type moving average. Multiplicative model, okay, this is where you get the seasonal ratio. You divide your actual observation with your centered moving average value. Similar to the calculation of uh, seasonal factor for this additive model earlier, for the multiplicative model, you can also uh, calculate in such a table that is shown on screen. Okay, so you calculate the total for the each, uh, for the each quarter or for the three year. Okay, if the data is not av available, just ignore it. Okay, once you have the total, calculate the average. Okay, so just remember, okay, a simple rule. When you add three items, you need to divide by three. If you add two items, then you, ne you need to divide by two because that is the meaning of average. Okay, and in this case, because uh, seasonal factor for multi multiplicative model, so they should equals to four. So in this case, you have uh, quarter one that is generally too much, in a factor of 0 0.768. And then you have the second quarter, April to June, 0 0.903. Okay, and then for the third quarter, July to September, so there's no factor of 0 0.98 after adjustment. Okay, and then the fourth quarter, October to December, the seasonal factor is 1.349. Okay, so you see that, okay, the first three quarter is less than one. Okay, the fourth quarter is more than one. If you add all of them together, that should give you uh, a total of four. Okay, because this is multiplicative model. Additive model, you add up the seasonal component, you should get zero. Okay, let's continue where we left off last time. Okay, we are still talking about multiplicative models. So in the next part for this uh, multiplicative model, what you need to do is calculate the seasonally adjusted production value. Okay, so let's look at the actual production data for year three. So you have the different production data for quarter one, okay, 36, quarter two, okay, April to June of 50, and then quarter three, okay, July to September, okay, production value of 54. And then for the fourth quarter, you have a uh, production value of 94. What you need to do is in the third column, okay, you take the actual production data, you divide by the seasonal index that you already calculated earlier. Okay, so let's look at the first quarter. Okay, the production value of 36 divided by the seasonal index of 0 0.768. So you get seasonally adjusted value for production, which is 46.875. Okay, you can round it up to 47. Okay, do you do the same thing for the second quarter? Okay, the actual production data of 50 divided by seasonal index for the second quarter, which is 0 0.903. So you get the seasonally adjusted production value of 55.37. You can, uh, that one is, uh, you round up to 55. So for the third quarter, production, uh, production value of 54 divided by the seasonal index of 0 0.98. So you get uh, seasonally adjusted production value of 55.1, okay, that is round up to 55. And lastly, for the fourth quarter, okay, with actual production data of 94, divided by the seasonal index for the fourth quarter, 1.349. So seasonally adjusted value of production for the fourth quarter of year 3 is 69.68, okay. So that one, you round up to 70. 
So in this case, uh, the next step, so when it comes to forecasting, okay, in, in this case, you would like to forecast what are the two production uh, value in the first and second quarter of year four. So what you need to do first is to calculate what are the trend increase per quarter. So in this case, what you need to do is take the last trend value, okay, which you get from the trend column, 55, and what are the what is the first trend value in the trend column, which is uh, 34.75, okay? So you take the different, you divide by, okay, from the first to the last trend value, how many jump, okay? So basically, you have eight trend values, so from the first to the eight, you need to jump seven times, so the uh, so you have seven jump, so the average trend increase per quarter is the difference between the, the last and the first trend divided by seven, so you get an average of 2.893. Okay, so that is average trend increase per quarter. So to forecast, okay, production value for quarter one in year four, okay, you take the last available trend value, which is 55 that you get from the second quarter in year three. So from second quarter in year three to move to the third, uh, to the uh, first quarter in year four, okay, you need to jump three times, okay. So bear in mind, where, where do you get that 55 trend value just now? Okay, that is from second quarter in year three. But you would like to forecast quarter one in year four. Okay, as such that what you need to do is, okay, the last trend value, okay, 55, plus three multiply with the average trend increase per quarter. So you have three multiply with 2.893. Okay, you have the answer, then you add to 55. Okay, and then the, uh, the whole part, okay, that is the trend part, you need to multiply with 0 0.768. Okay, I hope you do remember what is this 0 0.768. This is the seasonal index for quarter one. So what you get is the forecast value of production in quarter one for year four. Okay, the value is 49 after rounding up. Okay. So let's forecast, okay, the production value for quarter two, okay, in year four. So in this case, the same thing, you take the last trend value, okay, that is available, okay, from your uh, trend column, okay, which is uh, 55, okay, from that last trend value in quarter two, year three, okay, you want to forecast, okay, in quarter two, year, year four, so that means you have to jump, okay, that means the four line, okay, so in that case, 4 multiply with 2.893, the average increase per quarter. You have the answer. You add that to the last trend value, okay, and everything you multiply with the seasonal index for quarter two. So you get, after running up, a value of production of 60, okay? So that is basically forecasting techniques in the case of multiplicative models. Okay, I do hope, okay, you still remember the difference between additive as well as multiplicative model. Okay, so the next question that you need to ask yourself, okay, I want you to remember, when do I use additive model when it comes to uh, seasonal index calculation as well as uh, forecasting, okay, your data? Okay, and when do you use multiplicative model? Okay, the answer lies, okay, in terms of your scattered diagram, okay, in terms of scattered diagram that you plot. So if you see that from your graph or from your scattered diagram, okay, the, the seasonal uh, variation varies, okay, that means it's either explosive, okay, or the other way around, then you can say that there is a need for multiplicative model. On the other hand, if what you see from your scattered diagram, the seasonal variation is constant, okay, maybe that there is an upward trend or downward trend, but the, the up and down, okay, over the seasons, Okay, they are more or less constant. So that is a clue for you to use additive model. So we are done with discussing the first technique in forecasting for time series. The second technique that we will be using is what we call as exponential smoothing. Okay, uh, in order for you to, to, to discuss this further, okay, we need to understand there are two disadvantages or two drawbacks of using the moving average method of smoothing. Okay, the earlier method that we discussed, okay, which we call as moving average. So that is also a method of smoothing. But uh, okay, uh, don't forget that you just uh, see in the in the trend column. Okay, you see that there is no moving averages for the first and the last set of time period. For example, 
Okay, uh, if you look at your trend column just now, okay, what you see is the first two quarter is missing in year one, okay, as well as the last two quarter in year three. Okay, the last trend value that is available is only for the second quarter in year three. Okay, so what happened to the other uh, the other uh, quarters? Okay, when in actual fact you have the data for that respo uh, respective periods. So uh, we look at the second disadvantages. We can say that the moving average methods forgets that most of the previous time series value, since uh, the moving average method only look at those as, uh, around uh, it value. So exponential smoothing, okay, method will address these two issues. Okay, let's look at uh, the so-called exponential smoothing uh, techniques. Okay, an exponentially smooth time series is one that is given by that equation stated on screen. So you have s with a small t, okay, which is equal to w, okay, uh, multiply with y t small y t plus one minus w, okay, that one in bracket multiply with capital S, okay, subscript uh, t minus one, okay. In this case, for the case of uh, t, okay, greater than or equals to two, okay. What's the meaning of the equation? Okay, let's look at the item one by one. Okay, capital S T is referring to the exponentially smooth time series at time T. Okay, so this is something that we are going to calculate. Okay, while the actual data, okay, is given in terms of Y T, small Y T. Okay, so Y T refer to time series at period T. As for capital S with subscript T minus 1, this refer to the exponentially smooth time series at the previous period. So we, uh, we, we sign that as t minus 1, okay, while small w, that is actually what we call a smoothing constant, okay, so you can have a value between 0 and 1, okay, all inclusive, it cannot be negative, okay. So in this case, uh, the bracket t greater or equals to 2, it shows that for, for, for you to do this exponentially smooth time series, you must have more than 2 time series data. Okay, that means you have two, then you can uh, smooth your time series, you have three, but it can, you cannot do this uh, exponential smoothing if you only have one time observation. Okay, so the last equation, the one in box, is what we call the general equation. So in this case, okay, um, the exponentially smooth time series at period T is given to uh, equal to W multiplied with Y T. Okay, plus W in bracket 1 minus W multiply with Y subscript T minus 1. That is referring to the time series for the previous period. Okay, and then plus, okay, the, uh, the second uh, expression. Okay, and so on and so forth. So, don't worry, you don't need to actually remember this equation as long as you understand. Okay, for exponentially smooth, uh, smoothing uh, time series, you have the actual time series in Y. You have the smoothing constant in W, okay, and the subscript, okay, T minus 1 refer to the previous period, while T only is referring to the current period. Okay, let's look at this example 20.2, okay, how you're going to calculate this uh, exponentially smoothened uh, time series, okay. So in this case, you can calculate this manually in actual fact, okay, you can uh, actually uh, key in your data, okay, and the, the computer will do that for you, but let's say you want to do this manually, okay, so uh, using your computer, of course, okay, so you have the, the time period, okay, in, uh, in column A, okay, from the first time period until the last uh, time period uh, system. And then you have the actual data in terms of gas sales or petrol sales, okay, in column B. And then you have in column C, okay, the, the calculations, okay. In this case, let's assume that your smoothing constant is set at 0.2, okay. So the smoothing constant is set at 0 0.2. So in this case, okay, how you calculate the uh, exponentially smooth time series for time period 1? Okay, so basically it that does not change much. Okay, 39 in column B, so you put that 39 in column C. Okay, because uh, remember you need to have more than one time series observation. So in this case, let's move to the second line. Okay, in period 2. In period 2, you have gas sales of 37. So in this case, 
Okay, assuming that your smoothing constant is 0 0.2, okay, with a gas sales of 37. So, what you need to do is 0 0.2 multiply with uh, 37, okay, and then plus with, okay, 1 minus 0 0.2, 1 minus W is simply whatever uh, value of smoothing constant, in this case 0 0.2, so 1 minus 0 0.2 is 0 0.8, okay. So, you have 0 0.8 multiply with the seasonally uh, smoothen time va series value in the first period. So, in this case, you have the first period value, okay, after smoothing, okay, the value is 39, okay. So, how do you get 38.6, the value for period 2? Okay, 0 0.2 multiplied with 37, that's one part, okay, plus 0 0.8 multiplied with the previous period value, which is 39. So, both answers you add up, so you get exponentially smooth time series of uh, for period 2, 38.6. And the same thing for the third time period. In the fourth line, okay, in the third time period, how do you get uh, exponentially smoothened uh, time value, time series value of 43.1? Okay, 0 0.2 multiply with 61. Okay, 61 is the actual gas sales value. Okay, plus, okay, 0 0.8 multiply with 38.6. That is the previous uh, smoothen time series value in period 3. So you get the smoothen time series value for period 3, uh, okay, and line 4, the value is 43.1. So you can do that for the rest of the columns. In order for you to use your computer, okay, for the same example, just now what we do is uh, manual cal calculation. So for example 20.2 using computer, okay, you open up your Excel file, you recall your data, uh, in this case, XM 20.02, okay, and you click data analysis and you click for exponential smoothing, okay, don't forget to add your input range, okay, the damping factor is basically referring to 1 minus W, W is your smoothing constant, so if your smoothing constant is 0 0.2, so damping factor is 0 0.8, so if you change your smoothing constant, okay, for example, 0 0.7, then your damping factor will be 0 0.3. So it's uh, complement each other. Okay, so in this case, you click OK and basically uh, your computer will calculate everything for you. Okay, let's look at uh, the effect of different value for your smoothing constant. So in this case, okay, the one in red line is where you calculate the, the process of exponential smoothing using uh, a smoothing constant of 0 0.2. That is a small value. Well, the one in green is calculated using a smoothing constant of a bit higher, 0 0.7. Okay, so you see that um, compared with the actual data, the, the, uh, the dotted line in blue, okay, the red, the red line, okay, using a small value for smoothing constant, give you too much smoothing. Okay, so basically it takes out all the variation, almost all. You see almost a flat line. While the one in green with a, a bigger value for smoothing constant, 0 0.7. So you still have the up and down, you still have the variation. It's a bit smoother compared to the actual data, the one in dotted blue line. Okay, now let's look at the trend and the seasonal effect. Okay, a trend okay, can be linear or non-linear or it can actually take any number of functional form. So in this case, the easiest way of measuring the long-term trend is by regression analysis where the independent variable is time. So I do hope that you still remember, okay, we already done the topic of uh, correlation and regression. Okay, so under regression, we already, uh, we have y, okay, your dependent variable as a function of x, x is your independent variable. So we are going to do the same thing, okay, for the trend effect in time series, except that instead of having uh, your x in terms of independent variables, now your x for time series will be in terms of time. So in this case, whatever data that we are discussing, that will be your y dependent variable, okay, equals to beta 0 plus beta 1 multiplied with t plus the uh, random terms. Okay, so the one on the left-hand side is the linear trend, while the one on the right-hand side 
y equals to beta 0 plus beta 1 multiplied with t, okay, plus uh, beta, uh, beta 2 multiplied with t squared plus the error term. So that is example of quadratic trend. But don't worry, most of the time we stick to the linear trend. If you do not have linear trend, you can take log to your data such that you can use the linear trend. Okay, let's look at this seasonal analysis. Okay, so we notice that seasonal variation okay, may occur within a year or within shorter interval such as a week, a month or even a day. So in this case, to measure the seasonal effect, we compute seasonal indexes which gauge the degree to which the seasons differ from one into another. So in this case, when we discuss employment numbers, okay, for those who are taking economics, okay, when we discuss okay, in unemployment, for example, you also need to discuss about how many people are being actually employed. So we are discussing employment number. So in this case, employment numbers, okay, for example, are seasonally adjusted to account for summer job of student. Okay, uh, this is for the countries with uh, four different seasons, okay, clim uh, climate uh, countries, okay, they have the winter, they have the summer, okay, so what happens, summer is the, the month of holiday, three long holiday, so students at university, okay, they have a long break, so usually this is the time they look for short uh, summer job, so as such, okay, if you are going to consider the number of people employed in the summer, you will see a sudden hike, okay, uh, there are a lot more people employed. So in this case, okay, if you are the one who are analyzing such employment number, okay, you would like to know what are the change in employment number due to seasonality, okay, or is it because of a real change in the economy? So that is the question that you are looking for the answer. Another example that I can share is in terms of, uh, let's say, you are working for the power industry, okay, in terms of uh, electricity, electricity supply. Okay, so in this case, uh, okay, maybe it's not obvious in Malaysia, so basically our weather is more or less constant all year around, maybe a little bit of um, increase in temperature during the hot season, okay, and lower temperature in the monsoon season, but there is no need for us to use heater. But in the colder climate countries, okay, you see that uh, in winter, they use a lot more heater, okay, for uh, to keep warm. In this case, if you are working with a power plant, okay, if you are looking, for example, uh, to study the demand for, for electricity in England, for example, so you, you would like to know whether the, the increase, okay, over the year, okay, and, and then the increase over the season, is it because due to the... Uh, changing weather, changing season because it's winter. Definitely, people needs to to keep warm. Okay, they use a lot of heater, so they, they there is a spike increase in uh, electricity uh, needs. Or if you need to look at okay, take out the season. Okay, over the years, people simply use more electricity. So you need to be able to differentiate the different. Is it because of season or is it because real change, real change in demand? Okay, let's look at the step in computing seasonal indexes. Okay, so this is the procedure for you to compute seasonal indexes. Okay, uh, in the first step, what you need to do is compute the sample regression line. Okay, so in this case, you have your y hat equal to b0 plus b1 multiplied with t. Okay, and in the second step of the procedure, Okay, for each time period, you need to compute the ratio of your actual observation, yt, divided by the uh, observed value of y, okay, y hat. Okay, in the third step, okay, for each time of season, you need to compute the average of the ratio from step 2. Okay, and in the final step 4, okay, to compute the seasonal, seasonal indexes, you need to adjust the average in step 3 so that the average of all seasons equals to 1. Okay, in case you you, uh, you did not notice, okay, what we are doing now, okay, in order to compute the season index is more or less what I already discussed with you under the additive model. It's just that in the first part, okay, I changed a little bit, okay, we, you need to compute the sample regression line using computer. We are still discussing example 20.3. Okay, now you, we, are, we are in the process of computing your seasonal indexes. Okay, so in this case, to calculate seasonal indexes, uh, our example is about Bermuda Hotel occupancy rates. 
Okay, this is from uh, data sheet XM 20.03. So you have the year, okay, uh, from 2003 up to 2007. Okay, data is quarterly uh, data. And then you have the second column to show the hotel occupancy rate, okay, over the years from 2003 to 2007 for, for uh, each of the year four quarter. So what you need to do is add the ind independent variable time. So you have the fourth column time so you simply number it from the first observation one second observation two third observation three and the last until the last observation okay that is period 20 or time number 20 so in this case okay in the fifth column what you need to do is compute the sample regression line using regression analysis okay so in this case uh, you have uh, from regression analysis you will came out with the the, the equation intercept y Okay, y hat equals to 0 0.63.968 plus 0 0.005246 multiplied with t. t is your independent variable. So you add that to the, uh, th that one will be on your fifth column. So what you need to do next is for each time period, okay, for this particular examples, uh, 20.3 you need to compute the ratio occupational rate okay that is the actual data okay in second column divided by the uh, data okay from the regression analysis in the fifth column the one with y hat so this ratio is in the sixth column so in this case 0 0.561 okay that is the first quarter value uh, of uh, hotel occup uh, occupancy rate for 2003 divide by the y hat which is 0 0.645 so you get a ratio of 0 0.870 and you do the same thing for this for the second line and up to the uh, line number 20 in this uh, step 3 okay what you need to do is based on step 2 uh, calculation of y over y hat ratio okay so you have that on the left hand side of the screen okay all the different y over y hat ratio for uh, first quarter in 2003 up to the fourth quarter in 2007 so in this case you put it in the column okay on the right hand side you, you have the different year okay and then you have the different quarter value okay the ratio for the different quarter value so you arrange that all the quarter one value in one column okay all the quarter two uh, ratio in the second column okay in, uh, and then you have all the third quarter ratio for the third column and okay and the fourth quarter values in the fourth column okay level four okay and then you add them up okay and you divide by seven that will give you the average ratio of y over y hat for each quarter so for example if you look at the quarter one value so you have 2000, uh, 2003 the value of 0 0.87 okay there are some mistake in the uh, column uh, heading don't worry okay and then you have uh, in 2004 quarter one ratio of 0 0.864 and then 2005 okay quarter one ratio of y over y hat of 0 0.865 Okay, and 2006 quarter one ratio of 0 0.879 and 2007 ratio of 0 0.913. You that all you add up all these five uh, quarter five years quarter one observation and you divide by five, so you get the average ratio of 0 0.878. And you do the same thing for the second quarter. You add up all the second quarter value over the years from 2003 up to 2007. And because you add up 5, so you divide by 5, so you get 1.076. And then you do the same thing for the third quarter. Add up all the third quarter values from 2003 to 2007, divide by 5. You get average of 1.171. And the fourth quarter, you add up and you divide by 5, you get an average of 0 0.875. Okay, so we are still discussing example 20.3. So after the third steps, okay, in order to calculate seasonal index, in the fourth step, what you need to do is adjust your averages that is calculated just now in step three, so that the average of all season equals to one. Why they must equals to one? This is back to your model or uh, additive models. Okay, so in this case, 
okay average of um, all season okay 0.878 in the first quarter okay and then 1.076 in the second quarter and then 1.171 in the third quarter and then 0.875 in the fourth quarter you add them up divide by 4 so the average equals to 1 so in this case it happens that you do uh, you there is no need for you to change okay your index another option for you instead of manual calculation just now Alternatively, what you can do is set up your data in the, the way it's stated, uh, shown on screen. So in this case, on the left-hand side is on, of the screen, you see that the actual hotel occupancy rate, that is your Y, your observations. Okay, and then you key in, okay, uh, you add one column for the seasonal code. So you have the quarter one to quarter four for year three and so on and so forth. Okay, and simply uh, open up your Excel. Okay, data analysis and click for seasonal index. Okay, and use the seasonal indexes tool. Okay, in order for them to, uh, for the computer actually to come out with your seasonal index straight away. So you get the answer index for quarter one, 0 0.878. For second quarter, 1.076. Third quarter, 1.171. And the fourth quarter, 0 0.875. So there's no need for you to do the tedious calculation. I already highlighted to you, okay, calculation is one thing, but the most important thing is for you to interpret what you actually calculate. So in this case, okay, the interpretation of what we calculate just now, okay, when it comes to seasonal indexes, okay, what does it tell you is that seasonal index tells you that on average, okay, we are talking about hotel occupancy rate. So in this case, on average, the hotel occupancy rate in the first and the fourth quarter are actually below the annual average and uh, on the other hand the hotel occupancy rate in the second and the third quarter are above the annual average okay so in this case uh, can you think of an explanation for that is that logical if you are the economist in this case okay can you explain why the first and the fourth quarter are below the annual average Okay, and on the other hand, the second and third quarter are above the annual average. So this is the relationship between, you know, the country, okay, with winter, okay, and then those people in the, uh, during the winter season, they need to go overseas. They are looking for a country with hotter climate, in this case, Bermuda, okay, they, they, are good, uh, they are heading for the beach, especially. So in this case, that's why during the winter month, hotel occupancy rates, okay, in Bermuda are increasing higher than, uh, uh, below the annual average. Okay, well, when we talk about the second and third quarter, above the annual average, we're talking about this is the spring and the month of summer, basically. So in this case, um, if you look at the seasonal index, okay, the actual interpretation is that we expect the occupancy rate for the hotel in the first quarter to be 12.2% below the annual average, uh, the annual rate and the second quarter is 7.6% uh, above the annual rate. Okay, now we are going to put together okay, your uh, analysis on the time series as well as the seasonal index. So you see that the time series data in blue while well, the regression line okay, that you already calculated is the one in red. So you see it's being uh, it's smoothened, okay? it shows almost uh, a small increase but still it shows an upward trend increase over the years. In this part, we're going to discuss okay, how do you de seasonalize a time series. That means, okay, given a time series, how do you take out the seasonal factors? Okay, de seasonalize means you take out the season. So one application of seasonal index is to remove the seasonal variation in time series. This is by the word de-seasonalizing. Okay, and the result is what we call as seasonally adjusted time series. I think I already showed you earlier when it comes to the additive and multiplicative model. Okay, so why you need to do this de-seasonalization? Because this is to allow you to more easily compare the time series across season. That means there is no changes because of the winter as well uh, compared to the summer. Okay, so in this case, based on the seasonal index that you already calculated earlier, so for you to de-seasonalize your time series, the formula is very simple. Take the actual time series divided by the seasonal index. Okay, you, the ratio is what we call as the seasonally adjusted 
uh, data or this seasonalized data. Okay, so in this case, um, I'll show a little bit done over them. So for the first quarter of 2003, with a hotel occupancy rate of 0 0.561, with a seasonal index of 0 0.878, so the seasonalized, seasonally adjusted occupancy rate is 0 0.561 divided by 0 0.878, you should get 0 0.639. So that is after de-seasonalized. Okay, uh, now you can see that the, the effect of this analyzed okay, data in terms of the actual data, okay, the occupancy rate in blue line, okay, so you see the spike going uh, increase and de uh, decrease and increasing over the years and compared with that with the seasonally adjusted time series, okay, the one in red is being smooth, okay, uh, but you still see uh, an upward inc uh, incre uh, increase in trend. Okay, but you won't get a straight line like your regression data. Okay, when it comes to interpretation of your disanalyzed uh, data just now, okay, just imagine that you have a temporary horizontal line over there. Okay, so if you put that uh, imaginary uh, horizontal line and compare your disanalyzed uh, data, okay, the one in red over the that uh, horizontal line, you can see that, and you can say that uh, hotel occupancy rate over the years are rising, rising over time or increasing over time. Okay, before we go further, okay, let's look back uh, at chapter twenty two. Okay, in summary, so I do hope, okay, uh, you are able to ask yourself, and you must be able to answer this question yourself. Okay, do you remember the four different uh, parts of time series in terms of the four different components? Okay, what is trend? Okay, what is cyclical component? What is seasonal component? And what is the random component? Okay, so you must be able to explain each and every one of these components. Okay, uh, and if you look at the trend component, you can measure the trend component, okay, the long-term trend value in, from regression line. Okay, as for the seasonal variation, okay, how do you measure it? You by calculating your seasonal indexes. Okay, as for the random component, okay, from from the word random, something that you cannot predict, that something that is out of ordinary, that is not systematically occurs. Okay, what you need to do is take out this random component by using the method of moving averages, or you can use the method of exponential smoothing. Okay, so when it comes to uh, the next question, why you need to study time series, why time series is so important. Basically, the answer lies in the, in the fact that you can use time series, okay, for you to make forecast, uh, forecasting, okay, for you to make your prediction. And the for forecasting technique that we are using is basically divided to three, okay, you can forecast using the exponential smoothing method or uh, according to the seasonal index method or in terms of the autoregressive model. I won't be discussing this autoregressive uh, model much, okay, or the AR model. Okay, that one is for the higher level, but I'll be covering a little bit of that, okay, so that, okay, it can pick your interest so that you can uh, study, uh, study it further. So we are discussing about the uses of time series, okay. Basically, by understanding your time series, you can make your forecast. So how you make your forecast? So this is the forecasting models that you can consider. So the choice of your forecasting technique depends on the component that is identified in the time series. Okay, the three techniques that we'll be discussing is first, exponential smoothing. Okay, by now you should be already familiar with the word exponential smoothing. Okay, and the second one is what we call as seasonal indexes. Okay, and the third one is autoregressive model, AR models. Okay, uh, when it comes to which model to use, which forecasting techniques to use, so in this case, okay, you use forecasting with exponential smoothing if your time series display a gradual or no trend and there is no evidence of seasonal variation. Okay, there is no, not much uh, okay, up and down in terms of your time series. So exponential smoothing can be effective as a forecasting method. So in this case, to forecast for period T plus K, remember T is the current period, while K is referring to how many periods into the future. So K equals to 1, that means uh, period, uh, period of now, okay, the current period plus 1, okay, that means the next period. 
Okay, k equals to 2 is referring to current period, okay, and plus 2 in the future. Okay, k equals to 3 means, okay, current plus 3 period in the future. So, the forecast for period t plus k is given as capital F, which is equals to the uh, capital S with subscript t, where capital S is the exponentially smooth value computed using technique that we already discussed in the earlier part. When it comes to forecasting with exponential smoothing, okay, uh, as you can see in the upper column, okay, uh, when k equals to 1, okay, the forecast value, okay, current period plus 1 is referring to the next period is equals to st. Okay, in the second uh, okay, row, k equals to 2, that means the current period plus 2 in the future, capital F, forecast value of the 2 period in the future. Okay, and the third forecast, okay, uh, in terms of capital F, T plus 3, okay, they are all equals to capital S with subscript T. So, as you can see, you can produce a reasonably accurate prediction for the next time period forecast, okay, that means from period of uh, the current time period, okay, to the next period, that is T plus 1, but the accuracy of your forecast decrease rapidly for more than one time period into the future. Okay, that means from the current period to the next period, okay, your forecasts are doing okay, but from the next period to the next period, it's getting uh, not okay, okay, but still you can use it, that's the best that you can do, okay, but the degree of accuracy is increasing as you forecast further into the future. In the second method for forecasting, Okay, you, you can use the method of seasonal indexes. When do you use this method? Okay, if the time series that you use or that you have is composed of seasonal variation. You see, there is up and down, okay, within the year according to quarter, for example. Or if you are talking about your weekly data within a week, okay, for example, you see a spike on Monday and then reduce and then further spike, okay, on Friday, for example. Okay, so in this case, uh, there is uh, the existence of seasonal variation and then you see there is a long-term trend, whether upward or downward over the years. So if you see such things, then what you can do is do your forecast using seasonal indexes. Okay, combine seasonal indexes and the regression equation for you to come up with your forecast. For, for example, uh, the forecast for period T, okay, capital F with subscript T is given to uh, beta 0 plus uh, or B0 plus B1 multiply with T that is referring to your regression line multiply with your seasonal index for that uh, quarter okay or for that period okay so I think uh, by now you should remember this is uh, what we did for the additive model earlier okay let's discuss one example on the forecasting so in this example 20.5 okay it's still a continuation we are still discussing the hotel occupancy rate in Bermuda. So in this case, instead of having your data for hotel occupancy rate for 2003 up to 2007, but now you would like to forecast for the next year, that means beyond 2007. So this is what we are doing now in, 2000, uh, uh, in example 20.5. So in this case, you know that your regression line Okay, y hat is equals to 0 0.63968 plus 0 0.005246 multiply with t. So that is your regression line, that is your trend line. And you already calculated your seasonal index, okay, using your computer. So you have the seasonal index for the different quarter 1, quarter 2, quarter 3, quarter 4. So what you need to do is put them together. So your forecast value Ft is equals to your uh, regression line, okay, 0 0.63968 plus 0 0.005246t multiply with whatever your uh, respective system. Okay, so in this case, okay, in order for you to forecast, okay, capital Ft equals to uh, B0 plus B1t, that's your regression line, which is equals to y hat equals to 6. 3968 plus 0.005246t multiply with your seasonal index SI at period T. So in this case, continue into the next year, okay, through the first to the fourth quarter. That means the period, remember, you have 
20 uh, period observation just now from 2003 to 2007 okay five years each year you have four quarter of, uh, being observed so a total of 20 observation so in this case to forecast for the next period so uh, time period 20 plus 1 is referring to the first quarter of 2008 which is uh, unknown yet okay and then 20 the last time period plus 2 is referring to the second quarter for 2008 20 plus 3 that means the current period 20 plus the third quarter of 2008 and then 20 plus 4 is referring to the uh, current period plus quarter 4 in 2008 so in this case Okay, what you need to do is uh, add these few lines, okay, into your column, okay, so you still have your quarter, okay, in the 2008, in this case, quarter 1, quarter 2, quarter 3, quarter 4 in one column, and then you have the time period, okay, uh, uh, after 20 period, you have 21, 22, 23, 24, okay, and then you have your Y hat, okay, and then you, you already have your seasonal index, so what you need to do, okay, put them together, Okay, uh, your regression line, okay, multiply with your seasonal index, so you get forecast value, okay, for the hotel occupancy rate in quarter 1 of 2008, okay, value of 0 0.658, okay, and the same thing, okay, for the second quarter of 2008, okay, your, um, your regression line, okay, with period of 22, Okay, so multiply with seasonal index 1.076, you get a forecast value of hotel occupancy rate 0 0.812. And similarly, for quarter 3, you have a forecast value of 0 0.89. And then the fourth quarter of 2008, okay, the previously unknown, you have the forecast value of hotel occupancy rate 0 0.67. So that is a simple list. Uh, you can make it when it comes to forecasting using the seasonal index. The third method of uh, forecasting for time series is where you uh, can use autoregressive model. Okay, this is beyond the syllabus actually. I just want to share with you a little bit about autoregressive model because uh, if you look at, uh, if you go for uh, Google search time series, there's a lot of model, arch, gauge, okay, and all those stuff. Okay, basically it's referring to, you know, a different type of analysis, more extensive, extensive analysis using time series observation or time series data. Okay, so under this autoregressive model, okay, where or when do you need to use this autoregressive model? Okay, basically you refer to this model to do forecasting if your time series has no obvious trend or seasonality. So you do not see that, you know, up and down increase over the years, okay, within the seasons, within the quarter. But if you believe that there is a correlation between conservative residuals, okay, this is something that you need to study. For example, if you are doing econometric, where you come across, you know, heteroscedicity, uh, auto uh, correlations, okay, and multi scedicity and all that. So in this case, if you believe that there is a correlation between conservative residuals, that is your error term, okay, in the regression uh, line. So that is the time for you to decide upon you auto regressive model for your forecast. Okay, so that is the time auto regressive model will be most effective. So this auto regressive model forecasting is given by okay y t equals to b zero plus b one y okay uh, with subscript t minus one. That means okay your dependent variable is dependent upon okay the previous terms value okay so yt is the time series in the current period yt minus 1 is the time series in the previous period so current pre uh, current period value is depend upon the previous period value so there is a correlation between the conservative residuals okay so using the regression line it's still the same regression line y hat equals to b0 plus b1 y in the previous period y t minus 1 we are still discussing example 20.6 okay uh, in this case we are discussing uh, about forecasting using autoregressive model 
So let's look at the consumer price index. This is something that all economists, okay, or student of economics basically, okay, you must think of yourself as student of economics at all time. So consumer price index, or in short CPI, is a general measure of inflation and it is a widely used measure. Okay, so in this case, we are considering the annual increase, annual percentage increase in CPI, okay, collected over 29 years. Okay, and you need to forecast what are the next year's change in the CPI. So in this case, you have the year. Okay, I just shown a short one on screen from uh, 1978 uh, up to 2006. Okay, uh, I cut it short in between. And then you have the CPI value. Okay, and the most important column is the third column, which uh, show the actual percentage increase in CPI. I'm sure you know how to calculate this percentage increase. Yeah. Okay, in example 20.6, okay, you need to remember that we are trying to correlate the CPI in time period T with the previous time period. Okay, so percentage change means you take okay current period okay minus with the previous period value divide by that previous period value so basically uh, there is correlation okay the, between the time the current time period with the previous time period t minus 1 so hence you need to modify your data set from the the list in this case uh, that is uh, you pull up uh, from your excel file okay so in this case you uh, after you done this setup okay percentage change in x okay to percentage change in y okay so now you can run your regression tools so for example 20.6 okay for your cpi okay consumer price index you run your regression analysis so you get your intercept value for the coefficient 0 0.0070 and then for your uh, percentage change in x which is your your uh, previous uh, period okay for the cpi okay you get 0. Uh, 761 so that is your b1 or your beta 1 so in this case your regression equations y hat for okay in the current period is equals to 0 0.007 plus 0 0.761 okay y from the pre previous period so because the last cpi change is 3.2 percent okay you need to look back the original table okay for the last cpi change so your forecast for 2007 that is the unknown that you need to forecast now. So y hat for 2007 is equals to take your regression equation 0 0.007 plus 0 0.61. Okay, you need to multiply this with uh, the regression uh, the value for 2006. Okay, the percentage change in 2006. Okay, and you know that percentage change in 2006 3.2%. So what you get, okay, the estimated uh, CPI change in 2007 is 2.44. So what does it mean is that the autoregressive model forecasts a 2.44% increase in the CPI for the year 2007. Okay, now let's recap again what you have done so far, okay, what you have understood so far with regards to time series analysis. Okay, so in short, you need to know four different components of time series in terms of trend value, cyclical value, seasonal value, as well as the random component. So trend is usually over the long period of time, okay, over the years. Cyclical is something that occur uh, beyond the, uh, more than one year, but usually something like business cycle, it takes a couple of years, something like um, our uh, crisis, okay, like every 10 years or so, Okay, seasonal is usually variation within a year or within a week or within a quarter. Okay, and then you have the random, something that you cannot explain, okay, which you need to take out, okay, using the method of moving average or the exponential smoothing. Okay, when it comes to your trend, okay, so the trend component, okay, you can show it using your regression line. So it's similar to the topic of uh, regression. Except that uh, instead of discussing y as a function of x, now you have your y as a function of time. Okay, so what's the use of time series basically? Okay, for you to make forecasts. Okay, and you make forecasts using the three different methods of exponential smoothing, okay, seasonal index as well as the autoregressive model. Okay, I emphasize more upon exponential smoothing and seasonal index. While the autoregressive model is for higher level of studies, okay, for time series analysis.
Okay, basically that is for econometric time series. Okay, basically what you see on screen is something that you won't be scared of now because you already know about time series analysis. So if you, you work for a brokerage firm, okay, as a remiser, as a broker, so this one is a graph from the FSTE Bursa Malaysia KL Composite Index. So I'm not sure this is uh, exactly uh, when is the snapshot is taken, but this is for 2006 up to 2011. So it shows the movement in our uh, KLCI index. So you see that, okay, you have this uh, straight line, okay, it's either going up or going down, okay, and then you have the variation because uh, this is uh, over a longer period of time. If we want to, if you want to. To show the, the trend value whether it's increasing or decreasing, then you don't see much of the seasonal variation or daily variation. Okay, so um, KLCI index is very interesting. If you are able to see, okay, the changes, the variation, okay, within one hour, within one day, for example, okay, from the opening hour and right before closing, okay, and over the weeks, okay, when Monday, okay, the counter open, okay, and then usually before the public holiday counter close okay you see a, a sharp okay reduction or increase in the uh, business uh, amount of traded units so uh, this is something that you should be familiar with okay so basically time series analysis teach you how you read this graph in terms of interpreting the graph okay whether in terms of the trend value or understanding the uh, seasonal variations. So we have come to the end of time series analysis. Uh, here are some online resources that I managed to find. Okay, so basically what you need to do is uh, go Google, okay, the keyword time series analysis. Maybe you can look further under multiplicative model, additive model, or you can use the uh, keyword search for uh, trend and uh, component or seasonal variations or random component of time series. Okay, so this is some of the website which give you the basic in the first one, the basic of time series. Okay, and then you have the textbook on time series analysis and you also have uh, other uh, presentation uh, slide lectures. Okay, and you also have in the last three uh, line there is quizzes uh, that is available online. So you can check your understanding, okay, uh, either from using question from the books, okay, you can practice. Okay, at the same time, you can take this quiz, okay, multiple choice for you to test your understanding of the concept as well as interpretation of what you have done under the topic of time series. So that's all for today.